And we are so lucky right now to have Sun Ra sitting about five feet away from me here in our studios at WKCR FM New York. And now I turn things over to Phil Schapp and Sun Ra and company. Listen to WKCR, and this is the Sun Ra speaking, of the Sun Ra speaking. Sun Ra, voice of the cosmos. W- All right, we're in the studio, and uh, Sun Ra is here with us. We have a, a great deal of activity going on. I'm, I'm, I think you sold out the house here in Master Control here at the station, and we're mm-hmm. so pleased to have Sun Ra here. The Sun Ra, and I might ask as a first question for some of the musicians who visit us here on on Thursday evening. By the way, in case you just tuned in, this is the Sun Ra Festival. It's WKCR FM New York 89.9 on the dial. It's a Sunday night. It's uh, the day after the anniversary of Paul Revere's ride, and look who's inside here at KCR. <laughs> Sun Ra is in town. The Sun Ra Festival. We have Mitch Goldman, Charlie Blass, Andy Rotman, who worked so hard on the festival. My name is Phil Schaff, and joining us now with his ginger ale in hand, and we also have some ice cream for him, too. The wonderful one. Sun Ra. So, Sun Ra, my first question is uh, one more or less posed by Pat Patrick, which is he talked about a day perhaps as long as 37 years ago when the Sun Ra Orchestra was three pieces Robert Barry's drums, Pat Patrick's baritone saxophone, and your own keyboard work compositions. The addition of the, the four voices with your choral parts, your lyrics with the vocal group, and then the meeting of these incredible individuals who are still core members of your orchestra, you, the Marshall Allens, the John Gilmores. And what I'd like to ask, a musical question first, is as you got new individuals and therefore new pieces, how did it change your writing, the music that you wanted to write? Well, I just write what I feel. It's always the same. I'm keeping up with the cosmos and with the future, all the future, all kind of things. So I, I can uh, put messages over into music from all kind of places. I'm in contact with a lot of different places and beings. And I communicate with them and I can put down what they're saying or what they're going to say. It's all over into something just a uh, cosmos psychic, you might say. Well, your psyche has, has has reached the cosmos musically in all the different formats of the bands. Uh, but the, the the point, the 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 interest here from your very own uh, ensemble members was: uh, Did you ever want to write for when you had a trio? Did you want more pieces? Did you want to write for a larger ensemble? And do you continue to write for the small group within the band as you continue to make music today? Well, the world was never supposed to hear this music. You see, it wasn't uh, designed for that. It was really to not be part of the world, and it was going another direction because uh, I felt that everybody who innovated on this planet, they know what was accepted, whether they was classical composed or otherwise. So I didn't want to go through that. I had something worthwhile. I didn't need to have to fight to get people to listen to it. They needed me. I didn't need them. So therefore, I just went the way that uh, anybody else wise would go, you just uh, disconnect yourself from society and from everything, and you develop yourself spiritually. And that's what I was doing, not in a righteous manner, just advancing myself spiritually. Like some people develop their minds, I developed my spirit. I went another direction. And therefore, I went places. I saw things. I heard things that possibly nobody in the human farm ever heard before. And I recorded it because I, it was too much to write. And music is a universal language, so I recorded it, so I remember some of it when I played it back. Because I, it would, it's like in code, you see. And by me listening back to it, I can recall something that I may have forgotten about. Tell me, did, did you, have you only, you continue to write music physically on music paper. It isn't all just recorded. Uh, is that not true? That's right. I always sketch some things down. Uh, I used to write all of it down, but I got so many things that 
I don't do that now. It's shorthanded, you might say, in another, another way of writing. When did the idea come to you, and, and how did you mechanically go about recording your music as a means of preserving composition? When did you first get into recording your own music, and how well, did you do it? I was supervised by superior beings. They, they always fixed it up for me to do that, because I wasn't interested in it, and they were, for some reason. Although they don't seem to show much interest in humanity surviving, they still wanted this music to be recorded. So I did it at their behest and not at mine. We're talking with Sun Ra, who at all our behests has added so much wonderful music for all Cosmo listening to continue. And we have been listening to that very same music recorded and as played off the paper into microphones and recorded over the years. Virtually all of Sun Ra's known recordings have been played over the last few days, and here, not yet in the home stretch of our Sun Ra Festival, 116 hours of radioactivity of his music. It won't end until Tuesday morning, but this uh, weekend is being extended by the arrival of Sun Ra, who is in the studio and is talking with us about his career, his music. And, uh, you know, the music has helped you travel to these places you, you speak of. Is there, are there compositions or are there musical performances that stand out in your memory as you experience it, where what you feel, which is the most essential jazz quality, putting across feeling, was expressed to the fullest limits? Like, is there a work that you might isolate or a record or, or a performance where what you feel inside, what you've been made to do, has happened? Well, I got a lot of things. I got a piece called A Quiet Place in the Universe, which would really be nice for this planet to hear because it's, it would uh, eliminate stress because they, they would have at least a moment, a second or something, to uh, feel somewhere that's a quiet place in the universe. And that's a nice song. It's, it could really go into the classical repertoire. I got a lot of things that could fit right in, but I wasn't trying to seek recognition uh, anything like that. I was trying to, in a sense, bypass this planet. It's very difficult to be part of it. Huh. So, therefore, I didn't want to be part of it. I felt that I win my greatest victory by not wanting to be a part of this planet. And judging from what's happening here, I was right. We're talking with Sun Ra. This is the Sun Ra Festival on WKCRFM New York, 89.9 on the dial. You're hearing this live. Here's another question from Many musicians, you were speaking just a moment ago with Mitch Goldman and Charlie Blass about the, the phone calls have come in. The musicians, and I fielded some of these questions myself, we're curious about your opinion of your keyboard playing. For instance, in the last four hours, Prelude in C-sharp minor has been played. Sophisticated Lady has been played. All of your Spaceways music has been played, and your most recent piano elements of your own work, Reflection in Blue, the most latest recording. Uh... Do you feel comfortable, in, more comfortable, let's say, in, in a stride thing, in a blues stride? Do you, do you feel uh, the same sort of power you have in your musical presentations, in your own instrumental capabilities? How do you evaluate yourself as a pianist, as a keyboard player? Well, actually, I haven't really expressed myself on the piano the way I can, because, uh, uh, as I said, uh, in the early days in Chicago, I was doing that. And some pianists stole some of my stuff and became me in there. So then I decided to do my the organ and electronic things uh, because of that fact. And the piano players were asleep to what, I, to what I'm doing. But now they're waking up because I get a lot of letters and they want some piano records. Which and piano players were the last ones to wake up. How do you think you've influenced the piano players of today? What, in what way? In the electronics and in, in the voicings? Uh, in what way? Where are you hipping them? Well, they're just beginning to listen. They were listening to everybody else but me. And uh, they begin to listen now. I got a letter from a pianist. He said, in intricate, uh, intriguing piano. He wanted albums. He wanted uh, uh, maybe some writings or things like that. Well, 40 years ago there, in fact, more than 40 years ago, a major pianist of all time was enthusiastic about your piano playing. He was a man by the name of Fletcher Henderson. Well, that's true. He's one of the few people that really stops playing this band. Which the band didn't like the way I was playing, but Fletcher did. I had to finally tell them that uh, Fletcher plays piano. He, he hired me. And if a pianist recognizes another, then you should just shut up. <laughs> 
<laughs> but they kept on the phone. I gave my notice. So I, I left. Well, I, I gave my notice. And then the Fletcher didn't say anything. He didn't say he accepted. He didn't say he didn't. And next night they played, I came. And he didn't have a piano player. He said, if I didn't play, they just wouldn't have a piano player. So he was up there directing, and they realized he meant it. And they told me to come back on the stage, so my notice was over. That was a beautiful After that, moment. they didn't, didn't bother me because they realized Fletcher meant it. You know, this story, of course, and it's an equally important one in the annals of jazz. Uh, you just heard Sun Ra talk and document the Fletcher Henderson standing up to the band for the man. And in fact, Henderson had hired Lester Young out of Kansas City. Fletcher Henderson's the greatest talent scout we've had. He went to New Orleans. He wanted to hire one cat as Louis Armstrong. He went to Kansas City. He wanted to hire one cat. Who did he hire? Lester Young. And he went to Chicago in the tail end of his big man career and turned over his own instrument, the piano, to Le Sun Ra, who you hear telling the story. When Lester was in the band, the other members of the band complained, and Fletcher, when uh, Lester gave his notice, he let Lester go. But he learned his lesson, and he kept Sun Ra in 1947, and I'm glad he did. Well, I'm glad he did, too, because he really was a gentleman, and uh, he had a sense of humor. Well, he he would play humoresque sometime. I'd get up from the piano, he he would play that on the show, and he'd play Steel and Apples. That's all he played. Just we won them one night. But one night, he he just kicked off Steel and Apples, and he didn't come to the piano. The band was looking, but see, he had everything written. He had the bass parts written, he had the drum parts written. Everything was meticulous, and so I didn't ask any questions. I always do things uh, precision way. And even though I wasn't going to play the song, I had it right on, right before me when he called it. And mm -hmm. therefore, I played it because it was written exactly where he played it. So I played it just like him. So he just smiled. But I never, I don't, I don't know whether he forgot to come to the piano or whether he did it deliberately because he didn't, he didn't comment on it. He clearly encouraged you, though. Yeah. Before us is Sun Ra. Uh, Tell me, did you really say on television uh, that the, they asked you who you admired and you named Fletcher Henderson and the devil? Did that really happen, or is that a misquote? I said Lucifer, because Lucifer's a musician, you know. Uh-huh. You said Lucifer and Fletcher Henderson, or Lucifer and the devil. Uh, well, uh, <laughs> Lucifer is, is a musician. He didn't say that the devil is a, was a, the leader of the angels' choir. It said Lucifer is, and it doesn't say he ever got fired from that position, so... Uh, <laughs> In my book, he's still the leader of the Angels Choir. He didn't lose that. Um, so then I admire a master musician. In fact, I'm sure I learned quite a bit from him. From Lucifer. From Lucifer. And from Fletcher he's Henderson. Top, he's a top musician, and therefore I, I keep on moving forward on advanced stages. And when you do that in the human race of mankind, you should sure arrive above them. When you do, you come up against superior beings and they have to judge whether you are pure in heart if you're pure in heart you don't have to worry about the devil you don't have to worry about satan you don't have to worry about lucifer you don't even have to worry about god if you're pure in heart but if you aren't you're in trouble from all four of them all right well we're trying to be pure in our in our hearts about our love for your music and uh I, I tend that you have gathered that Fletcher Henderson was pure in heart. That is why you included him in a list of people you have reflected on favorably. Of course he was. He, I, I didn't see him with any vices or anything like that. The only thing they could say about him was that he liked to play the horses all the time. <laughs> they talked about that. But, I mean, it's just like playing golf, I suppose. It's just <laughs> recreation. We have an interview going on with the Sun Ra here on the Sun Ra Festival, WKCRFM, New York, 89.9 on the dial. This is happening live, and uh, there's a lot of energy in the room. I think someone brought it here with him. The energy of your music is something that the musicians, again, and, and they have stacked up the questions for you, so I'm sort of a, a vocal piece for them to, to express these things. When you wrote, one of the things that uh, impressed Pat Patrick, 37 years ago, impresses Pat Patrick now in 1987, are the variety in the in the parts and that the in the strong indication of what you wanted for the drums or the percussion to do. 
the percussion you wrote drum parts even when there was a trio is that correct everything has to be written in harmony the melody the rhythm i <clears throat> i'm different from most writers they might write the melodies and the harmony but they they leave it to the drummers or the bass player but i have to have everything tailor made this way it's just a natural gift to to have everything you might say perfect in an imperfect world and I tell them make the music according to the individual. That means uh, if somebody else gets in my band, I've written it for somebody else, they won't be able to play it, don't care how great they are. You take like um, Fletcher Henson's band, the band, was, they was always telling me, why don't you uh, bring out some arrangements? Fletcher asked me about it one night. I said, but they can't play in my arrangements. And they laughed me to scorn. They told me they played Fletcher Henson's arrangements, Solomon, everybody. It's ridiculous to me to say, they say, we professional musicians, we can read anything, sight read anything. So Fletcher called a special rehearsal the next day in Chicago. And at 2 o'clock, he said, rehearsal. At 4 o'clock, Fletcher said, he's right, you can't play it. And it's huh. written right, too. And the two songs was Deal with Southland and um, I Should Care. It wasn't fast, you know, but the syncopation was different. I write differently in syncopated things. Uh, like Coleman Hawkins, I played with him and Star Smith, and he he liked what I was doing. So then one day, one night he asked me to write down something I was playing. So I wrote it down for him, and years later, in New York City, Village Gate, the, the Baroness, Nika uh, Rothschild, she, well, I don't know if she believed it, because she got in the dressing room, and she asked Coleman Hawkins, do you remember him? And Colin Hawkins said, of course I do. He's the only person that ever wrote any music that I can't play. He said, I still got that song. It's written right. I can't play it. And I don't know why. Do Would you say one of the whys is because of your meticulous nature and somewhat innovative being in percussion parts, that your music has a rhythmic content and a specific percussion accent that makes it Sun Ra music, makes it the music of the cosmos, which is not present in a great deal of the orchestrations in jazz that you came upon as you were coming up. But it came from somewhere else. <laughs> I was taught by somebody else, the superior beings. A lot of them, I was taught by them. But the things. drum part is a key part in why your music's different. Of course, our incident happened here in uh, New York City, a drummer that was playing with Mary Lou Williams. He wanted to play with us. And I was staying on Third Street then. He came, he rehearsed with us every day. He was very frustrated. He couldn't get what I was talking about, although he'd be playing the rhythms. But something else he knew that he didn't have. So one night, one day he came to me and told me that he had, had a, a vision. He he was walking up in heaven in clouds and things, and he heard it was a dove up there. And behind this door was all kind of rhythms, all kind of drummers. And the voice told him, open the door, and you know what Sun Ra is talking about. But he said he was afraid, afraid, so then he, he left us. I saw him one day driving a taxi. He said, I should open the door. On the other side of those doors, he said there were many drummers. And Sounds. That they, they, see, I'm talking about sound. I took a drummer to... Uh, uh, he's a nice drummer here in New York. I took him to Europe with me. And Berlin, all at once, he started screaming, I can't I can't get the sound. And he beat his head on the drums. He was people thought it was part of the act. Huh. He said, I can't get that sound. Well he was playing, but certain sound, he realized I deal with sound and he was spiritual enough, psychic enough to know he was playing and wasn't playing at the same time. So he left us too. So some people come in this band and then they have to leave because something happens, um, something I can't explain. I had another drummer with me and he was from Haiti. So I felt that uh, a drummer from Haiti could really catch the rhythms. But it, it ended up where he didn't eat, he didn't sleep. He didn't talk to nobody. He just went. He just went out somewhere, and uh, I said maybe he's in voodoo something. People came and got him. He still, still was out of it. 
But when he was in the house and he wouldn't talk to anybody, and I told the fellas in the band, well, you know, well, uh, don't care what I do to him, don't care what I say to him, don't say anything. I'm going to make him talk. So he's laying down on the sofa. So I went and I sit on his chest. And um, then he started moaning. And I said, <laughs> well, uh, did you hear something? And the bass said, we didn't hear about it. I said, I heard, I know I heard something. Like a person. They said, we didn't hear anything. And finally he spoke. He said, Sonny, you too heavy to sit on my chest. <laughs> <laughs> and after that, he talked, but uh, that's what happened. He, he said, so, so get up. And after that, he talked. But he, he didn't, he didn't make it either. He went out, so I had to send him to Washington D.C. So take him to his sister, and get a, a note that you delivered him. Cause I don't want the problems. Another drummer was playing with us, Red Bank. And he's trying to. He's a school teacher. He's really a good drummer. Something he couldn't get. So one night he just got out there and started walking in the rain. I had to tell his wife to come and get him. So he left us. So it's not easy to play in this band because there's certain things you have to have. You have to belong. You have to be rated by superior beings as suitable. And if you're not rated, I'll be telling everybody, it's not my band, it's the creator's band. And you have to, if if, if he doesn't, they're not suitable for the future, they won't fit for the present, and therefore they can't play. So if it's my band, uh, it'll be a lot of people in this band, but it's not my band. It's somebody else's, and this music is a language, and um, I I have held back on a lot of things because then the people won't like it. But it's a possibility that if uh, if they did could see what I'm talking about, in a sense, I'd be in trouble because I'd have five billion people. Um, they asking me questions. That's what I told them in England. I said, you know, they said, well, why haven't we heard more about you? And I said, well, I've been playing a low profile. I said, uh, why? I said, because I've been telling people I'm the ambassador of the creator of this planet. They might believe it. And then I said, uh, can uh, England, can the uh, airport accommodate five billion people to come to see me if they will believe it? They said, huh. I see what you mean. I well, I can I, I see some of what you've seen. I can say that that Haitian drummer speaks for many of us here at the station, WKCRFM New York, because the presence of Sun Ra is a heavy one. And we are we're really being influenced by that presence. One of the things that we're talking, by the way, I'm Phil Schaap with us, the Sun Ra. The interview is in progress. It's live. It's clearly a, a very, very important day in our trying to get with the better music of the cosmos. This is our way to try to be better listeners for that new sounds and for these sounds. One thing that's clear with these drummers that you've gone through over the years is that the drum part and the, the rhythm and the sounds, both the, the written part and the sound as it should be hit, as it's executed, has been a, a complex issue in your music. And you progressively have had others taking adding to the percussion. It starts slowly. You're one of the key ones. Then there's more and more and more until everyone is, almost everyone is helping with the percussion thing. Uh, how Can you in any way enlighten us on how you made those changes and what stages and, and what what you were trying to get, what specifically you were trying to get by having so many individuals joining in the percussion? Well, in Africa, they used to speak with drums. Probably other nations did it too. And uh, so you have to start. The drums are talking too. So if they're talking one thing and the horns are talking another, which is happening with quite a lot of bands, then you have confusion. People might hear it, but the, it's the, sooner or later that spirits will uh, discard it because of the confusion. You see, and so therefore, if I the drum parts have to be fit in with the melody, definitely. If I don't have any harmony, the drum parts have to fit in. They have to coordinate with each other, and then the harmony got to fit in too, because the melody can be all right. The harmony might have to be real odd and strange and totally different from the melody. It might have to be if that's the message. So then if the harmony is just according to what they're teaching in schools and things, then um, 
Well, it, it wouldn't it wouldn't be any other message than what they've been hearing all along. But when the harmonies moved, the direction which it seemed they're not supposed to move and still fit, you got another message from another realm, uh, from somebody else. Uh, uh, superior beings would definitely speak in uh, other harmonic ways than the earth way because they're talking to something different, and the, and you got to have chord against chord. Uh, melody against melody and rhythm against rhythm. Mm. When you got that, you're expressing something else. I'd like to ask one last question on this drum part business and relate it to jazz and perhaps to an individual you're aware of. Uh, recently, Eddie Durham of the original Count Basie Orchestra passed away, I'm sad to say. And trying to latch on to what made his music swing off the paper, we're talking now maybe not in a complete uh, being of music, but in a specific, a jazz music kind of concept. One of the things that I feel was a secret of the success of Eddie Durham's music was that he l concentrated so hard on what the percussion was doing while the music is going by, that he did the same thing in the very same way you just enunciated, which is that he's he has the, the rhythm part written to go with the melody and the harmony rather than just leave it to the rhythm section and the percussionist, the drummer and that this was something of the success of his music. Do you think that because this is a this jazz part of your music, jazz music, is such a, a, a rhythmically dominated force musically, that it is essential to direct the rhythm if you're going to be a true composer, and that that's what you have done and perhaps a few others, such as Mr. Durham did? Well, you have to talk baby talk. You know, you have to do like this, let's say, ubat, shiva, if you want to express it like that, and they'll play it. But if you're not able to talk the baby talk and tell them that goes like this, ubat, shiva, and like that, they'll play it. So then he, he he had to have a code when he said, I want this played like this, and he'd hum it like that. He'd bend, bend words and things, and they'd play it like that. Because if this go by the written thing, a musician would know how to bend a note unless you tell him, and you tell him better with the baby talk since they're used to it. So you're directing uh, uh, the little ones and the medium ones and on up and they're ready to play the rhythm, telling them how to do it. You, you have to, yes, you have to hum it. Uh, and they will play it. But otherwise, they'll play the notes. Mm. And then, hey, that's all right. Playing the notes isn't enough. you got to swing it. you got to bend notes a certain way, and then you got to um, rest just the right number of microseconds, uh, not too long, not too short, and that's very meticulous, you know. A uh, composer might write something down there, put an eighth rest down there, but maybe it's supposed to be a sixteenth rest point one ninth or something. This over into fractional music, which I do quite often, fractional rhythms and fractional music, and then that guy be telling the drummers, well, now I'm I want you to do um, full full time point two, and I, I'm over to that now. And that's meticulous, you know. They they're not aware of the fractional elements of music, but I'm dealing with fractions, fractions in uh, rhythm, fractions in harmony, fractions in melody. I'm moving to the fractional music now, which that means um, it's well, it's quite difficult for a musician to deal with that unless they activate that spirit. And a spirit could do it, and I'm not talking about righteousness, I'm talking about something else. That spirit spirit doesn't count anything, you know. It deals in this timelessness, and so it doesn't make any difference. But by full, full time, it, it will play what, the way it's supposed to be. Because I write with my spirit, you see. And music can play. Sometimes I tell them, I can't hear you. They play louder. I say, I still can't hear you. Because my spirit can't hear you. Mm. Now, when my spirit hears them, then it's all right. Mm. But they could play that very best, and I still, it wouldn't be right because my spirit would say, no. And if I did with my ears, well, I'd say, all right. But when you start dealing with spirit things like I am, then you rise up above religion and all philosophies and everything else man is talking about. That makes it quite difficult for to get to a person, you know, because they're not used to that. They used to... Uh, measuring everything. I'm dealing with the spirit and it's not measurable. That's why I talk about immeasurable equations. It's quite a problem, particularly in America, that is uh, more uh, materialistic than any country in the world, I suppose, because most of the people who came here came here to make money. 
So that's <laughs> why I haven't really been successful here because the materialists are so busy making money, they can't hear me and they can't see me. That's why I go to other countries that don't have too much money and trying to do something on a social way for everybody, they can hear me. You know that brings- Even though they may be atheists, they, they can hear me better than the righteous can because the righteous are trying to go to heaven anyway. Uh, they're trying to do that. I'm, I'm really planning to sue the righteous um, <laughs> for loving Jesus more than they love me. <laughs> We're talking with Sun Ra. This is the Sun Ra Festival. And you're mentioning of America, and if we might extend it to the, the earthbound audiences that you perform for, this brings up the question uh, whether that spirit can be conveyed in a different way. You've, you've written out a great deal of your music. You've recorded as documentation both for your own listening playback and for us to listen to and learn about and feel that spirit, the music. If, perchance, you were to be called to another space in cosmos where we would not be able to be in touch with you because we're mere earthlings, could your music be performed from that paper, from the recordings we know about, from the recordings you've made for yourself by earth musicians without your direction? It's forbidden. I'm really dealing with forbidden music for humans. They got that thing. They they play what they know. They play what they feel. This is something alien to them, and I know it. But it has a uh, possibility and a potential for them to really gain immortality without being righteous, uh, without having, ever having done anything that's worthwhile. It's not like that. It's something else. Do you have any interest in other jazz bands or other bands, orchestral organizations on earth, playing your compositions? There's some of my in our BQ playing. And, I know. And uh, uh, some more, too. They've written me about it. It's all right. They can play it play it that way, uh, Neil like me. But I got so many things. After all, I got about 50 years of recording music and rehearsals. And then you add that up to how many hours that is and how many days of rehearsing every day, six hours, at least composing seven compositions at every rehearsal. So I got a storehouse of treasures, and I can just lay back and listen. That's what I do most of the time now, listen to these treasures. But really, the world should be hearing it, but then they don't have no way for me to present it to them, you know. I'm not a minister or anything. I'm not a philosopher and all these things, and a statesman, and I'm not a, a politician. So you see, this planet only deals with that, politicians, religionists, and and things like that, and school teachers. I'm not any of those things. It's only one of me, and uh, that makes it, and it will not be another. You see, I'm just uh, I'm just here. I'm passing through. You might say, often this planet is something that's so valuable that all that money and all that gold and silver and everything they know. They can put that in the wastebasket compared to what I have to tell them. But as I said, it's about churches and governments and schools and things like that and sex and all that. And so naturally, they wouldn't, uh, they might miss what I'm talking about. Are there specific political lessons in your music for the, for Earthlings? Well, I mean, a matter of discipline rather than freedom, a matter of precision rather than mistakes. Uh, um, denying the fact of what they say in it to areas human, feeling that is not a good thing to say or to build a principle on to allow humans to make errors because there is, uh, if they make an error, they should be able to know it and correct it before something bad happens. But since they're not being taught that, well, you, you know, they do make errors and that's when planes fall and different things happen because of the errors. If they were psych, if they were psychic enough, they would know when a person is a is a hijacker whatsoever. They would know what they're gonna do before they uh-huh. did it, and they tell them if they were psychic enough. But they aren't psychic, and they make a lot of mistakes sometimes, and incarcerate innocent people, and that's not good, you know, to do that, because the cosmos uh, it will not uh, allow a people to progress if they um, harm. Uh, Judge Ron can send one innocent person. It can hold a planet back and, and hold a nation back and make a government fall to really uh, misjudge one innocent person because there is a creator. 
and he judges by that. A nation is judged by uh, how well do they teach, I mean, treat the innocent. And that's when America's in danger now because the fact it's so busy making money, it's not, uh, they go out looking for dope addicts and all those kind of people. But what they should look for, they should have a police department looking for the innocent and the ones who are gifted by the Creator and take care of them. And don't care how bad they are, it, it would be overlooked because they did exactly what the Creator wanted them to do. But they got all these jails and all these coats and everything to go out looking for people who are doing wrong. And they don't have no police force to go out and look for people who are doing right or want to do right. Huh. But they only get them when they've done something wrong. Then they go and they, they have all these research centers for the dope addicts and the this and that and the other. Mm. They do that then, but then that's one-sided people. If you only got uh, organizations set up to get people who are doing wrong and help them to rehabilitate themselves and do nothing for those who are not doing wrong and trying to help, and they need to put that into order. Because I said that you can't have justice. Uh, if you got a, a, a code that's condemning the guilty, you must have right across the street another courthouse with judges judging the innocent and those who are trying to do right and help them. You're, you're, uh, you feed them and get them somewhere to stay and all that. But didn't a, a man has never done that. He'd be busy out getting the ones who are doing wrong and yeah. the ones who are sick and the ones who are dead and dying and spend millions of dollars for that and nothing for innocence and children who are really gifted. They put them over there in public schools with some people who might kill them, talking about equality, and that's wrong because um, nature is strange. It sends gifts to all kind of people, all kind of races, and a nation should look for those first before they look for other criminals. Look for those children who have something to offer in the future because uh -huh. some of them do have something to offer. Some of them don't, so... Talking about equality, the Creator gets rid of that when every time you send somebody gifted, he's done away with the, the idea of man's democracy. And every now and then he sends some giants. Uh, they can be in science, they can be in music, entertainment. He don't send one, just one, and there will be another one like that, you see. And that's what people have to wake up to that there's no equality with the Creator. He, he sends one somebody. When a nation needs, it might be a bad man, you know, like a nation might be put together by somebody that the world hates, but he'll do his job, you know, because he's supposed to get that nation together. Right. It's like I had one drummer. <laughs> he left the band. <laughs> he left the band because he said, uh, he said, well, today you said you're wicked and evil, and I've never been with a leader who says he's wicked and evil. And I said, well, have I ever done you wrong? No. Have I ever said anything to you wrong? No. I said, what you worried about? He said, I'm worried because you say you're wicked and evil. I said, well, if you got a shepherd leading some sheep and he denies the wolf, one of the sheep, the wolves would all get together and say what an evil shepherd he is. But if he sh saved all his sheep, the sheep would say he's a good shepherd. Uh -huh. I said, if I, I just, I'm just going to say nice things to you and uh, say I'm good and all that, and someone comes to attack you, if I attack them back, then, well, that would make me evil to them. So I'm not going to restrict myself just to be good and righteous when in order to survive, I have to do something for those who are my friends. You just and, heard, you've been hearing a lot of uh, the preferences of cosmo neutrality, as you refer to it so often, and you're hearing it live on the festival of the man who is from the cosmos, the musician, the personage from the cosmos, Les Sun Ra, here on the Sun Ra Festival on WKCR-FM New York, 89.9 on the dial. In here in Master Control are a lot of spellbound people. I am one of them. My name is Phil Schaap, and I'd like to ask uh, Les Sun Ra uh, two questions, both uh, perhaps getting a little bit onto a, a musical thing. You, you mentioned about the passing through nature and that it is, to a certain extent, your music is not to be played uh, outside of your direction, but to a certain extent, other bands' attempts at playing it are okay. You mentioned NRQB, among others, but there are others who play Sun Ra's music. And when you were saying that, you say, well, you were passing through, and that and you may be gone, but when you first started passing through, on the first end of this journey, you met people who, or 
things or schools or things that enhanced your musical school skills. One key force, of course, is coming from the creator. It's saying it's leading you to find the elements to put together a greater whole, which you've done. Could you be, if you could, specific about how you came to be a musician, how you gained the skills to play music, music that we can recognize, we on earth can recognize as music? Well, the music was designed just for one. But how did, before you started playing the music, what sort of training did you get? Well, it was really my way of, of um, appreciation for the creator. The creator has everything, but I wanted to do something that the creator didn't have. Were you totally self-taught? that's when the music started. I played it for the creator. Every day I composed something for the creator. Even that's, when you were, even when you when were I young? When I first started, 11 years old, around that, that's what I was playing. I wouldn't even play for my family. I played just for the creator. I didn't play nothing for them. Now and then, maybe they might bring a church song for me to play. I'd play that. But otherwise, I did not intend to play for the public. I played just for the creator. That's when I got a lot of ways for what I call music from the private library of God, because that's exactly what it is. It was made, and then it seemed like the creator wanted some people to hear what I was doing. I, in Chicago, I first organized this band for... Um, to uh, to rehearse 10 years without anybody hearing it, without the public hearing it. And they could play with other groups, and uh, but uh, otherwise it was not supposed to be out to the general public. And then a, a dancer, and then it got so, a lot of folks was at the rehearsal. I couldn't keep them out. And a dancer named Johnny McAfee, I think his name, he, he came one day rehearsal and he said, um, we was playing... Old Man River, and he said, uh, don't play that anymore. I said, why? He said, because it's so beautiful, they'll steal it. Don't play it. Uh, so then he said, now, Miles is playing around the corner at Birdland. I, you should be there. I'm going around there and get this band a job. It shouldn't be just rehearsing. So I I really didn't want that. It was, it was interfering with my plans. But he went around there, and... Uh, I played the furthest out things I could to not get the job. So then the <laughs> owner place named Kyle like Bob, he said, play that again. I played again, and he said, the band is high. So then that frustrated my plans. And then <laughs> it went on, and he told me, as we stayed there maybe about two years, one night he told me, I've had all kind of musicians in here, top musicians. You're the only gentleman musician I ever met. Mm. I, I feel about you like I would a brother. He told me that. So you see, that again, I, uh, that's another story, and I saw him in Chicago. Well, he was telling me, now you're playing the, uh, the space thing and all like that. Maybe one day it would happen, folks would go to the moon and all that, but my son would be grown and have a grandchildren before then. Uh, so then they sent us put neck. And I call him, and I said, hi, your grandchildren. <laughs> Son Ra, I have a question here from Charles Davis, uh, one the, that he came to and appointed uh, the interview on Thursday, and then he said, you'd better ask Sonny. So we're asking now, could you describe from scratch one of your rehearsals, one of the ones in Chicago? Well, you know what scratch is, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's probably how you could rent the hole. That's one of the devil's <laughs> names, old Scratch. So you start from scratch. <clears throat> well, well, the rehearsals, I tell them make everything. You take like John, when he first, uh, when I first met him in Chicago, he had to come to the house every day by himself uh, for rehearsal. And when Marshall got in the van, he had to do the same thing. And Victor Sproles. And what would you do? Charles Davis. Well, them? I just rehearsed with them. I was busy getting a psychic picture of that spirit, and I knew what to write for them. But it would sound better doing that than anybody in the world. And that's the way it is. I tell them make music according to the person's spirit, and maybe sometime according to their potential. If they're not exactly where they should be, I have to write according to their potential and bring them up to the image of their potential. So, see, it goes another way. And when I do that, it doesn't take too long. The instant I, I sketch the image of the potential, they'll play the potential, even if it's 50 years from now. 
they'll play that with me, but not with anybody else. Well, how did you instruct them? What What's a specific? I just play. Uh, so let's play this. And then they play it, try to play it. Uh, maybe a stand and I said, let's play this. I'm trying to see what they can do with mm-hmm. it. And I keep on doing that. And one day I hear something and say, yes, they'd do better in this direction, rhythmically speaking. Sometimes it's hard for musicians to play with me because sometimes I play in between the cracks. <laughs> and sometimes I might play a card, like for instance, I told a, a vibe player, I said, don't, don't stand behind me and look at my hands when I'm playing. You might get messed up doing that. So, of course, he did it. <laughs> and then he had to quit because he, they, they, he'd see my hands playing one card and another would come out. Uh, seemed to come out, mm. and this, he couldn't understand that, so he had to leave too, <laughs> from California. But that's what Coleman Hawks would be doing when I was playing. He'd be looking when he wasn't playing. He's was looking at my hands, and that's what Stu Smith said. You know, I don't know why people haven't discovered you playing the piano. Maybe one day they'll hear. And that day's sort of starting now. You say a little bit with the younger players. Well, possibly. I, if I just open the door, they can't do it. Let's open the door, you know. Mm. Open the door, and to other musicians, uh, sort of psychic door, and then they would understand what I'm doing. But actually, I've had a closed circuit, you know, right. like closed circuit TVs, uh-huh. and they couldn't get in. Uh, do you think it could be illustrated in a in any kind of of uh, a piano book, or would have to be a direct teaching? Is there any way that you could, if you chose, to open the door to convey it to other pianists? Of course, I'm a I'm a teacher, you know, and I, I know. can teach anybody anything. <laughs> I took teacher's training in college, and I'm very good at it um, to make things that are very complicated quite simple. If I wanted to, but then uh, what price glory or whatever you call it, I didn't. I didn't need that. I got a lot to offer this planet. But I say, they deal with politics and religion and money and all those things. And uh, they're quite happy in their ignorance. Why should I interfere? Mm. What does it mean to me? If, they, if they're if they happy of being ignorant, then they are really being part of something greater. I'm not supposed to interfere because I'm not a human, you know. Mm. I'm an angel. I used to be an angel. but um, And you've nice always been feeling. polite. I used to be an angel, but the other night, and Captain, the MC got up and said, I want to introduce the Archangel Sunra, so I ring up in promoter. Because <laughs> I didn't tell him that, you know. Hmm. He said it. And the way this stuff is, whatever man says, the creator writes it down. And see, that's where they have to be careful. Whatever they said, he began to work on what they said. And they're not aware of that. You don't care how wrong it is. He'll build up on it. He'll dig on about maybe a hundred years building up on something they said. And it might be ever so wrong. He still build on it. And that's what they don't realize. Well, maybe early Tuesday morning, all of us should just freeform say things about our feelings and niceties towards Sun Ra. And maybe we'll come up with something that can be built upon. Well, of course, that's where the, that's where the, uh, the key to the whole situation in the world is based up on what people say. That's when, uh, in the early days, the spirituals were being sung. When these people were saying, you better mind what you say. You better mind what you're talking about. You got to give account and glory. You better mind. Uh-huh. You better mind what you're saying. They were saying, they were saying that, and it's quite true. They were quite, they right. And the, the, the bad part about it is that uh, the United States is a place of glory because of America means house of glory. The way they spelled it. They're not spelling it the Hebrew way, but in the Hebrew way, America means house of glory. Uh-huh. And the flag is called Old Glory. So this is the place of glory. So out of all the countries in the world, watch what you're saying in this country. Because it's quite different. It's a spiritual, magic place. And all kind of things can be done by what you say, what you proclamate. you got a lot of confusion here because... Uh, well, it is since it is America, I'll, I'll go by the rules and say this is WKCR-FM New York, 89.9 megacycles on your FM band, and we are transmitting now the words, the information, and the musical, and the spiritual that we can garner from listening to Le Sun Ra, who is speaking to us live in our studios as the highlight 
There's something I said, the highlight of our Sun Ra Festival. And uh, I'm, I'm very pleased that you're here. I like to use the words of someone who, uh, who used to tell me about Chicago in the early years. He, he is not someone we were able to interview this week because he died a few years ago. And I'm speaking of the bassist Ronnie Boykins. And Ronnie, when he used to visit the station over the years, the one thing, and I remember him telling me over the years that he said over and over again was the rehearsal, you'd be stunned when it was eight hours long. And then he'd surprise you, and it'd be 16 hours long. So the question, although I'm adding some of myself to this, on top of what Ronnie Boykins told me, is what was the purpose of the rehearsals themselves being so long, so incredibly uh, long in terms of hours and energy expended? It was because the Spirit of God was there. And I couldn't stop rehearsing until it left. Because all my rehearsals, the Spirit is there. And when it's there, then things can happen. But when it leaves, I, it's no need of me rehearsing. As long as it's there, I rehearse. It'll be there. But when it leaves, I might just not rehearse because it's not going to do any good, you know. They build that human element and the man thing, and they, you can't teach a man nothing. You can only, if you activate his spirit, you can. But he's such a big dummy until he gets distracted by things. And you can't teach anybody anything if they got these distractions going on. So a spirit being, which I we don't bother about it. If they're distracted, we push them over there to that distraction, let them have a nice time until maybe they might wake up. Some of them don't wake up until they're getting ready to die. Then they can see things clearly, mm. but then it's too late. No doubt they have to come back here. They didn't make it, and they have to go back start all over as a little baby, which is really a curse to come back here. Everybody's talking about being born again, but really that's a curse to have to come back to planet Earth. <laughs> but they think it's a blessing, but it, it, they got everything backward, and I'm not about to uh, to try to uh, get churches to believe what I'm saying. It's not going to do any good because all of them going to die in the atomic, I mean, a nuclear warhead anyway, every man, woman, and child. And there's no need of trying to do anything for them if they don't listen. If they listen, they can say themselves, but they don't listen, they are going to die. The Pope said that about uh, six months ago, that every man, woman, and child on this planet is subject to be eliminated forever. He didn't say nothing about Jesus saving them. Mm. He said they had to change. So it's not me talking that fanciful things. I'm talking about things that... Um, they could do something to to change things if they use the first law of nature. It's whether they forgot nature. They should use the first law of nature. And that means if they do that, they'll listen to what I'm saying and do something about it because it's up to them. I'm very well in tune with uh, the angel of death and with God and Lucifer and the devil and whatever you got. They're all my friends. Mm. And so, therefore, I don't have anything to worry about, you know. But they do, because they're not friends with these beings. Do your musicians ever have anything to worry about? Your musicians, the players in the orchestra. Well, John, about three months ago, John was told me, he said, you know, you'd even fire me, wouldn't you? I said, yes, if you got in my way, mm. I would. I'm here to do something on this planet, and no one is get in the way. So if you frustrated me, you got in my way, I would fire you. So Were he those crying, and he knew I meant it, so he got back in the truck. But um... <laughs> <laughs> were, the, were the rehearsals the rehearsals in any way a test or a challenge to your musicians to see if they were of the right metal for for the orchestra? Was that that part of why they were so long and so strenuous? Well, not necessarily. I'll be judging about. I knew Ronnie wasn't going to make it. I'm judging mm. about. By something else, like it's a singer I'm interested in now. I saw him the other day for the first time. And I told him to come out to rehearsal. So he did. The first thing I saw was his humility that made me interested. But, you know, he could be ever so great and don't have humility. I wouldn't be interested because then I've had cases where I just build somebody up, you know, like the amateurs and I build them up. But they wouldn't be amateurs long and something happened. They didn't make it. Their pride jumped in the way. They didn't make it. So then I have to deal now with humility. If they got this strange humility, 
which is very uh, alien to human beings. And then, I, then I'm interested. Somebody got humility, they're treasured, and this thing does have that. So then I, I was utterly amazed. You know, sometimes I meet people that amaze me in this jungle, and that's what I go by now. I be looking for this strange thing about people. Some of them have it. Uh, uh, in Germany, I saw three horses that had it. They couldn't play the instruments, but they had. <laughs> souls and i knew they had a soul i was just i was utterly amazed that here were some horses that had more soul than men and women uh something is happening you know maybe they're evoluting up to be what people should be but they definitely had souls now some people are empty and you're at this point they don't seem they don't have any souls if they have it it's but it's at such a low level that it's almost non-existent and it's a possibility that those who were not using their souls, it would be uh, transferred to somebody else, you know. Well, this is some soulful experience here, our visit and lesson from the teacher. Hey, Sun Ra. Sun Ra is here, live in our studios at WKCR-FM New York, 89.9 on the dial. A highlight here, our interview with Sun Ra on the Sun Ra Festival. My name is Phil Schaap. I hope I am learning as much as I can from these these statements, and I know that I've learned or at least enjoyed and learned from the music. We're going to play some of the music that Sun Ra has brought to the studio. We have a, a record queued up on the turntable, but one question before we listen to some music. In your music, is is the sound, the timbre, of equal value or more value or less value than pitch, than, absolute, than an actual designated pitch, the way the note sounds rather than what the note is. It's like nature. You can't find two leaves alike. So therefore the notes can't be exactly the same. If they hit two notes like a C and it's hit about five or six times, each C got to be hit differently. Now, uh, I mean, each one of them. Mm. You can't hit them on the equality basis. They got to be hit different so each note would have individuality. That is what a lot of musicians don't have. They don't know how to play, and they hit that C the same way. It's intolerable with me. I can't have that. It has to be where they be hit the proper way. Maybe one of them supposed to be loud, or one of them supposed to be softer. But then you have to have feeling to do that. You can't teach anybody about the timbre of notes by this tell. They got to come in with that feeling, you know, like a prize fighter comes in with that potential. And uh, basketball, everybody has these potentials. But uh, some have potential to drive race cars. Everybody can't get out there and drive a race car. They can't even drive around the corner one one block. But they weren't meant to do that. But some men do, and women too. Mm -hmm. They do have that potential. And they can do it. And that's what the world got to do. It's got to get some people who can do things that are natural and put them in their proper place instead of uh, trying to make somebody do something that they can't do because they weren't meant by nature to do it. Would it's I, quite simple. Would I be ranking things in order if I were to say from top towards bottom, spirituality, this is in terms of what the music should remember, it, spirituality, feeling, sound, pitch, in that order? Well, Cosmo, omnivorous spirituality, because you know you've got a lot of spirits that are very evil, uh, and uh, they they they've been in charge of this planet a long time. And uh, when I first came on the planet, they knew they would never conquer me and never get me to be part of that whatever they're doing. And they fought against me bitterly. But uh, the more they fought, the more I laughed up my sleeve because they because I I know that uh, if I just uh, bypass this planet, I would have won a great victory. I felt if I really conquer this planet with words, I would have lost my objective to bypass it. So you see, it's a very uh, it's a very strange situation where men have fought and died trying to get the people on this planet to be their slaves or to be such. Mm. And I've been trying to say, well, no, uh, and that the people don't change, I don't want nothing to do with them because I will desert them. If they don't change, so I'm not going to get in a position of leadership and they're not obedient. And I just let them have it, let them be free. Mm -hmm. And that's not right to do that. So that's why I don't have a church or anything like that because, it, it, you know, they get over there and they say, if they say, well, I'm for you, 
and they demonstrate their art, they get left. And that, then they would be out there, and they'd be in a worse condition than they were before because they will know then, and then they can't get back there and get over there with the people who don't know, and they're in the most dreadful position. But then once I turn them loose, that's it. I don't come, I, I would not come back. Uh, they would have to have some kind of special permission from the creator or something. But you got five billion people on this planet, mm. and they, they give a chance to somebody else. It's very simple, you see. You give it to somebody else or somebody who hadn't heard about it. You give them a chance. Like I told a fellow who was dancing with us, he was disobedient. So he'd been trying to get back in the band. I said, well, five billion people on the planet, you get at the end of the line. I get to you after I get to the other five mm -hmm. billion. We're going to get to some of the music that Sun Ra brought here today as part of our Sun Ra Festival. You listen to W. K. Ciara, and this is the Sun Ra speaking, of the Sun Ra speaking, uh, Sun Ra, voice of the cosmos. The music of Sun Ra here at the home of Technical Difficulties on radio station WKCR-FM, New York, 89.9 on the dial. Phil Schaff here with you. In the studios is Sun Ra. These are uh, live radio proceedings going on at this time. We just heard some music from an album that uh, we might uh, say had a scanty amount of information on it, uh, West End, Sun Ra, 4, 5, 6. We did hear some uh, solo work from... Uh, Michael Ray on trumpet on the third of the selections, which I might call a six. Uh, any comments you'd like to make on that music, Sun Ra? It just rose one of the mainstays of the band in Chicago. I always thought to have bass players who really was basic, you might say. And uh, it just rose one of the ones. Uh, okay, uh, we had a typical uh, KCR experience here, which of course is something that was working perfectly well a few minutes ago, in which we had uh, uh, allocated to the most important chair in the room. The red one over there with the new microphone we became quickly the broken apparatus. We are, have repaired it and we are back on the air. You're listening to the Sun Ra Festival on radio station WKCR-FM New York, 89.9 on the dial. A little bit bewildered, but now I think uh, righted ship here going to a new land of Cosmo neutrality and musicality. I'm Phil Schaap. With me is Sun Ra. We just heard some music from a Saturn 10-inch, uh, excuse me, 12-inch LP, uh, labeled Saturn 456 uh, Sun Ra, and with the uh, handwritten heading West End. And, of course, I do remember a rather joyous uh, visit from Sun Ra at the West End. That's across the street. This is here at KCR, and we're really glad that you're here. I like to head in two directions about musicians. We were speaking a great deal of musicians while we were feasting on some ice cream, some oranges, and apples here. And uh, uh, your your bass players you were speaking of and the, the kinship you feel between Cecil McBee and Wilbur Ware. I'd like to ask you some questions about musicians who come on the scene playing music, which some relate to your music. Uh, since uh, since you started creating your orchestra, uh, what did you what do you make of and what did you think and where do you place in your ears and 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 feelings the music of Ornette Coleman? Well, I liked them when he first came out the rhythm section with Don Cherry. See, I liked that what he was doing, but he's over in another school, you know, another dimension. Uh, but he's doing something different. He's had quite some difficulties about it, too. But uh, another school, you know, maybe the Earth School on a higher plane. But I'm dealing with something totally alien to this planet, totally immeasurable, totally impossible. And if people don't uh, believe it, well, it's their natural instinct not to believe something. It has nothing to do with them whatsoever because they're born just to die here and they haven't had any opportunity to do nothing else. This is offering them something else and not because they're righteous because I never met a righteous one and I'm sure I never will. So therefore I wouldn't dare impose on the people talking about looking for somebody righteous because I wouldn't nobody make it. 
But it's something about a spirit, the spirit of people. Some people got this spirit. It's kind of scattered in all nations, really, everywhere over this planet. They're not at home with their family, nor school, nor church, nor anything. They're just out there. I suppose those are the ones I came to. They're ready to go somewhere else. And that's what I'm talking about. Somewhere. It's a big omniverse out there, and they can go outside this universe to other places because they have evolved to that particular stage where things here uh, are very insignificant in comparison to what they feel. They have a feeling that there's something else, and they're right, too. Something else is on the ultimate plane, and I meet people, sometimes I look at them, I go to different countries and I look at people and see that they are part of whatever this is. Mm -hmm. are, are there musics made by people on earth that have caught your attention that you like? You said you liked Ornette Coleman when he first came on the scene with people like Billy Higgins and Ed Blackwell. And Billy Higgins played with me. Yeah. Uh, I like big bands. Mm -hmm. I don't like small combos because they can express themselves just so far and they're limited uh, although they can do some very wonderful things, they still limit it. Uh, I like big bands because I like a lot of sounds. Um, I like Jimmy Lunster. Sounds are wonderful. I like Fletcher Henderson. Some things kind of basic for you. I like that. But basically, above all, I like the, the discipline of Fletcher Henderson, and no one else has ever come up to that. And incredibly enough, they were so together that uh, I'm beginning to say they couldn't possibly have been men. They must have been angels. Because uh, all the other music might play their arrangements. It's not the same. Something else over in there. And like Coleman Hawkins said, the Dretch Henson band had never been recorded. The people never heard the band because they never could catch certain something, certain something in the music. It couldn't be recorded. Did you speak with Coleman Hawkins about Fletcher Henderson when you worked with him? Well, I don't remember doing that. Uh -huh. No, I missed a good opportunity to do that. Because he was part of that band, he might have been. He might have been more than. Uh... Well, he did say something like uh, Fletcher. It would have been better if he'd stuck with Stomps and, yeah. instead of branching out other things he did say that yes I, I know in fact uh, something that maybe many of the major musicians should have been afforded is an opportunity to make these speech records talking records because Coleman Hawkins set down a lot of important thoughts on a double pocket with that oh, yeah, very, records. that's very valuable and very you wonderful just referred uh, to things unfortunately this planet was so busy with other things they, they let something they had a touch of the creator in them you see the spirit of creator and uh, I would say they were more of more value than churches because they were directed from the Creator. The churches were dependent upon a book. Hmm. They were outside the book. We're talking with Sun Ra. This is the Sun Ra Festival on WKCRFM, New York, 89.9 in the dial. Phil Schaap in the studio with a host of Sun Ra's musical colleagues and friends, a host of KCR people. We're working here at the station, particularly the uh, festival coordinators, Charlie Blass, Andy Rotman, and uh, Mitch Goldman, uh, program director Brian Kaiser is peeking through that window. We're all here, and uh, one of the things we just heard as Sun Ra was speaking to us is, a, is an interesting uh, reason for appreciating the big band, because there can be more sounds made by more pieces. And um, he isolated some of the distinct sounds of the big band swing era, Jimmy Lunsford's orchestra, which had different arrangers given different sounds at different times. The bassy thing, which had a whole new way of swinging the blues. Uh, and then you isolated Fletcher Henderson's band as uh, the premier one in your, your opinion and in your listening. Uh, what did Fletcher Henderson's band do musically that you feel was so blessed, so from much, so much from the crea creative? Because well, I like uh, Tatum, too. You know? I know. <laughs> Red Fatswaller. I like all the piano players. Nearly all the piano players make it in my book because they always be doing something. But what did Fletcher Henderson or Fletcher Henderson's band do that uh, makes you call them the greatest of the bands that, that you heard? Because it's together. Mm -hmm. It's like one man. 
and it's clean cut, you know. It's not any fuzz in there. It's just clean cut. And that that makes it, uh, it's so clean cut. Sometimes you might think it's just two or three pieces. But it's the whole band. And you wonder, you listen for the second part or something. It's, it's there, but it's down up under the first part. Most bands you see, you can hear the other part over overriding the first. Not in his band. It was perfect. It was his brother. Nice band, too. Horace Henderson. Sure. But it was a difference in it, even though Horace sometimes would play with Fletcher. It still was a difference when it was up under the name of Fletcher, when he was in charge. That make it, made it most remarkable. Right. Sun Ra, speaking of Fletcher Henderson. Discipline's a word that you use in your compositions, in your conversations, and perhaps in your appraisal of some of the greater musicians you've encountered. Uh, you even use discipline over freedom as one of your preferences of the cosmos. Uh, uh, what sort of discipline do you invoke on yourself to improve your abilities as a musician or as a composer or as a band leader? Well, see, I have to go by the book, which they call the Word of God. It says, a man cannot learn without discipline. And I have found out it is true, although I don't particularly like the book. Uh, it does. It is the truth. It's, it's the not my kind of truth. It says, um, a man cannot learn without discipline. I found that out. That when they get in this band, if they don't have any discipline, some kind of way, one day I'm going to tell them to do something, they don't do it. That means they're through. <laughs> when you said book, you were referring to the Bible a moment ago. That's right. What are some books that you have read that uh, that you would want, let's say, me to read? Well, it's some forbidden books, you know, <laughs> X-ray and searchlights. Uh, it was a seventh day. That's one book that's very hard to get, written by a slave, a person who had been in slavery, who had a sixth grade education, who said that God dictated him to write that book. It's got all things, and a lot of things in that. It's incredible. That's one book. And what is the title of that one? It's called X-ray and searchlight. Of the seventh day. Searchlight of the seventh day? Mm -hmm. Okay. Any others? Well, Bavaska wrote a lot of things in the interest and the different books that uh, she wrote. Uh, Seek, Secret Doctrine. Um, it's all kind of books. That, um, God's Children by Archibald Rutledge. That's very interesting. And, uh, of course, the Bible is very interesting, but you, you should read mythology. All the books on mythology got secrets hidden over in them about things. Gilgamesh Epic is interesting. It's got some in there that's very vile. It was written before the Bible. And way back then in Assyria, uh, in Babylon, with the folks who were supposed to be sinners, they were worshiping God too, and they, they what they were talking about is a value. And then the Egyptian, of course, the top thing is some of the wisdom of the Egyptian sun priests that, that were living in Heliopolis, but you even have a, nothing left there but one little obelisk um, where they were. But that proves that they were dealing with something that was very important, but they're obliterated. But what they were doing was not obliterated. It's very important for this plan to find out what were they talking about. Because they were talking about immortality, one thing. And uh, Secret Wisdom, Moses was over in there studying at school, too. He just made a lot of mistakes because he didn't stay long enough. You know, a little learning is a dangerous thing, so Moses didn't stay that long enough. They taught him the black writing, but they didn't teach him the red writing. Huh. And the red writing is very important at this point for the say this plan the red right not the black right could you give me an example of red writing well it is stated not as i am written now my red so you spell red r-e-a-d you spell uh -huh. r-e-d too so then you got these trick words phonetics uh, everything spiritual came from the east and east loves uh play on words i love that as do you Yes? Well, in a sense, I don't really love it, but it becomes necessary sometime to see what they did 
it's affecting us now. You have to know what they did. And everything would be solved. I mean, resolved between the East and West if you know the way they think and what they did. And some things they said is really a trap to the East. And they're going through this thing of killing and murder and all that kind of stuff. Righteous people, too. But they trapped by words. And so they, this planet is really trapped by words. And they're going to get out if somebody know the right words to say to trigger the cosmos to do some of value instead of what they're doing. Right now, the cosmos is set up just like a giant uh, computer machine to really just cause people a lot of uh, harassment and uh, destructive things like disease. The cosmos is set for something bad for this planet, but it, it, it's, it's because of the words that they've sent up there, you know. And these words are trapping people and destroying them. When they say they believe in some things, and some things they, they say they believe in is not good for them, but they're supposed to be intelligent enough to stop saying these things. It's destructive for them. But that's all what's wrong with this planet. They're saying things that are destructive for them and make them self-destruct. That's when they need somebody over them to guide them at this point where they can get out of this. But if they try to do it themselves, they're not strong enough. They're dealing with cosmic forces that judge you like a teacher. Uh, they might ask you some question through another person. They might ask you, what's the good word? And then you answer. You think you're talking to that person, but you're not. You're talking to the cosmic master. Say, what's the good word? And then ask you, what is the good word? And you're supposed to say what it is. <laughs> and if you answer correctly, like a friend of mine died three times. Three times he died. It's on record in Philadelphia. Play Congo drum. Name is Crowder. And on one of the deaths, he said he went through a tunnel and saw a light. He followed this light. And he met two beings on the other side. One of them was God and one of them was Satan. And I said, did they see, seem unfriendly unfriend to each other? He said, no. <laughs> they were very good. I said, that's what I thought. They were on good terms together. They huh. fooled the world together. So then he said, they asked him the same question. What's the most sacred thing in the universe? He said, first he said the water, then he said fire. He finally said he didn't know. But suppose he had answers. Mm. You see? So no tell these people have experiences, and they ask things. You, you like in a school. This is a school here. And you're supposed to answer. When those, one of those cosmic beings asks you something, you're supposed to answer. Mm. The whole planet can change. If you can find one to give the right answer, unfortunately, they don't know the answer. We're talking with Sun Ra, who presents some suggestions, if not answers. From so I'm playing in the music. I'm telling them answers in the music. If they listen to the music, they will learn something, but they have to be, well. well Sun Ra, before we, before we uh, talk about the music, which actually is, is something that I'm overjoyed to do, uh, earlier I'm asking questions, I'm not providing answers, and I'm also speaking for some other people. A lot of great musicians have come into this room, have been part of the Sun Ra Festival, and have offered questions for us to ask you, and we did sort of over in the last hour or so. But a lot of the listeners, the people, if I might speak for them, and it's hard to you know join them all in one question, but they have all sorts of curiosities that perhaps you might uh, like to take care of. Uh, for instance, let me just offer some. Do you speak more than the English language on, on of the languages on the planet Earth? Do you speak any other languages beside English of our languages on the Earth? I'm speaking music as a language. Okay. I find it much better to speak that way because uh, words can be twisted and turned and everything. But music is something that's pure. And if you're playing something sad, people will know it. If you're playing something about love, they'll know it. If you're playing something about war, they will know it. They will know mm -hmm. what that song expresses. So I find it's better to express myself in music. Although in foreign countries, sometimes I send people out to get something for me and they don't know the language. They don't never bring it back. And then I go out and I get it. Uh -huh. And that made people think I must know all languages. But uh, I can't explain how I go out and get what I want and say, see that? It's easy. And, um, you know, like I was looking for iodine over there. And everywhere I went, couldn't get an iodine. 
they didn't know what you're talking about, you see. So finally, I had to call the creator on the case. So he said, well, um, you make you make the, uh, the symbol for our dime. They know what you mean. Uh-huh. So I found the symbol and went there and I got me some iodine. But they called it by another name. But the symbols are the same, you see, all over the planet. So therefore, if you knew the symbols are a different thing from the cosmic forces, you get things done. They, it would be recognized. Symbols are quite important. I use symbols quite, quite often, you know. One of the symbols that is important to people on Earth is the uh, is the concept of family. A lot of the listeners wanted you to, to be asked, could you tell us something of the, the people you were with when you were growing up in Birmingham or any family since that time that you could speak of? Or your family? Well, at three years old, the creator separated me from my family. He said, well, I'm, I'm your family. And from then on, I was under his guidance. Mm -hmm. I was there. And I wasn't there with them. They didn't know nothing about my relationship with the Creator. I never spoke of it. My friends didn't know anything about it. Nobody knew. I suppose they weren't supposed to, but that's who guided me. And I said, and I wonder how did I, how did I get through school and college and all that without the family? How did I have everything and I wanted? Were you physically separated from the family that had raised you till the age of three? No, I was, I was there, but I wasn't there, you know. Mm-hmm. I was there and I wasn't there. And could you tell us, the, the schools, you, you know, and you, you've referred to the, your collegiate experience, and we've talked about it before. Could what's, What actual schools did you attend? Uh, could, you, could you call them for us? Well, I was in Birmingham. I was there. I wasn't there because I didn't know nothing about prejudice in, 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 in the South until I was 14 years old. Mm -hmm. But I didn't go nowhere else. I was right there. So I was there and I wasn't there. I didn't know. Well, uh, until I was 14 years old, that just showed you I was out to lunch or something. Uh -huh. what but I college, was out to lunch with the creator, so it was all right. What college did they did you get sent to eventually? Well, I went to, well, eventually, the main one I was at was at A&M College in Huntsville, or Normal, Alabama, right up there by, I was right near the space by Von Braun, uh, I was right up there with, and. Of course, uh, you were there first. Uh, yeah. But I was right there waiting to develop in this ride. And then I went to Bama State where Erskine Hawking was. I was down there for a while, a short while. Uh, but I didn't, I didn't go anywhere else. But, but that main school, I went to high school in Birmingham. And I was sort of isolated. I was protected. I was in the first grade. In the first grade, an element from the the primal grade up to high school, I had the same seat made. I had the same classmates. There was no change. I went went all the way through high, uh, elementary school with the same people. I went to high school, junior high, school, same people, and I graduated with the same people that I started with, which is quite unusual. How did you get impossible. the nick How did you get the nickname Sonny? Well. Some people said that. Some people, well, well, I was talking about a stage name, and I picked the name Sonny Lee. You see, that's what I picked. And then I said, well, no, because Baron, they had a Baron Lee. Then they did. In fact, they had a trombonist, Sonny Lee. Yeah. And so <laughs> then I said, well, that's where it. it just stuck, and they said Sonny, you know. And then uh, when I. I came to New York. You see, they'd they be saying that Sun Ra has another name, but that's impossible because, why? Because Sun Ra is not a person, it's resting in New York as a business. So it's improper to say that my name was this, this that, and other. It's just a business. A business name established has no family, this, that, and other. So I saw to that. I did what Jesus didn't do. He should have rested with somebody, the governor. I rested as Sunra, as a business. And so therefore, if I want to save this planet, it ain't nobody's business if I do. <laughs> I have the authority to do business on this planet, not in a religious manner, but straight business. And if I say, well, and the business is different, do not say what my business is. I really forgot to put it on there. I did. But they stamped and sealed in New York that Sunra is a business. And I can just, be in, just go about 
my father's business, you might say, uh, which is quite appropriate. As I said, if Jesus had wrestled with one of the government as anything, he wouldn't have got crucified <laughs> because he would have had to thought with the government. And Caiaphas, uh, who started this whole thing about somebody dying to save the world, he, he wouldn't have had a leg to stand on. <clears throat> so I got the thought of New York City to be in business. And that's what Sun Ra is. It's a business name. Here's now, the Sun Ra, of course, that's my my legal name, stamped and sealed in Chicago by a judge <coughs> to say I'm not supposed to be known by any other name. So I could really sue me a lot of people and give me a lot of money by them saying, since I got the, the legal paper stamped and sealed by the judge, that I'm not supposed to be known by any other name. So I got two things going. Sun Ra is a business, but Sun Ra is, 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 a, is a person, you might say, uh, supposed to be known by that name only. All other names have been abolished by a judge. So, see, I'm doing things legally. Mm -hmm. But you still uh, are fondly referred to by the nickname Sonny, by your musicians, among well, others. Well, it's got the Sonny Ra. That's Sonny. It's spelled S-O-N-Y-R. And in one language, that's, that really means Sonny. Mm -hmm. Here's a question. We're talking with Sun Ra. This is Phil Schaap. This is the festival. This is WKCRFM New York. Uh, could you tell us about the differences in the placement of your orchestra in Chicago and what it felt like being in Chicago, New York, and then Philadelphia? Take Describe the three cities and your experiences in them one, one at a time. Chicago, New York, Philadelphia. Chicago is where I was given all kinds of tests by God, Satan, Lucifer, and the devil. What's this? To be able to, I was given all kinds of tests by God, Satan, Lucifer, and the devil to see, could I stand up against the whole planet and answer them and turn them around the other way? So they would all be attacking me with words, constantly asking me questions that they thought I couldn't answer. But I answered all of them. So I had my good train in Chicago with all these people on my case. They'd look for me. To Do you talk. think that the test was that you had to, you you were playing and presenting music for other people, other bands, other circumstances, slowly evolving your own ensemble, and it took a long time for for it to be, find its way to, to present the music in other places? I had gone to other schools, you know, mm -hmm. and I was over there in another school, and that was very difficult since I was hearing things that was, was actually shocking. They could flip a person's mind. And I had to go through that where people come up with their ideas and they say such such thing. I'm I'm a college person, so here's somebody up got a sixth grade education say something that's most amazing. And he said I got a sixth grade education. But I respected that. I started to listen to what they were saying. And since they didn't know nothing about reading and all that, they were saying things from a spiritual level that would quite uh, prove to me to be uh, very informative and very important on a wisdom plane because they were speaking from the spirit. And I met men like that, a lot of them who had sixth grade education or something like that, who knew more than the, the others who had all this school training. So I respected that, and I still do. Quite often the creator comes and talks to me through a person, teenager or somebody, that not supposed to be know so much, but they be speaking in the spirit. And I respect that. I, I always listen, you know. Uh, they be saying the most amazing things. And it's up to me as to whether uh, whether I can catch on. It's, mm -hmm. it's like that. So I had to be educated to say, oh, well, this voice here is what? a strange voice. And then I listen at it. And maybe uh, 30 years later, I can say, that's what they meant. Some things... It was hard for me. It was hard for me to accept. But then I know I put it all together, and it was quite true. I just needed other parts to put it together. And that's what I'm doing now. I'm putting all these parts together because um, there's a lot of people working, trying to get me in Paris, in, in France, to take over all the French musicians, you see. And then um, I might be appointed to a minister of culture for this thing they call ECU. You know, Europe is getting ready to get united, and they got something. I forget the symbol they got. But it, it, they could make me the Minister of Culture of Europe, and that would be something. I love Because that. I could do a good job. When I was in Alabama, 
the last time a man came up to me, a white one, and said, what would you do if the governor appointed you Minister of Culture of Alabama? And I said, uh, what would you do? I said, I'd take over the Symphonoxes first. I'd take over all the musicians. I'd change Alabama with music. And then he left. What do you recall? You know, it's funny. I said Chicago, New York, Philadelphia. I left oh, out Chicago. Birmingham, Alabama. Uh, you were inducted into the Birmingham Hall of Fame, and uh, you, you said you, you played with Papa Joe Jones. He went in the same day as you did. Uh, yeah, we, they, we played. It, it wasn't, you know, they didn't have a piano, and it, they was in this exclusive hotel, but they didn't have a piano. They had a synthesizer or something like that. Uh, that wasn't proper, you know. I was very unhappy about the situation. Should have had a piano. That's what Joe's used to play with, you know. Played something. Um, and this bass player was with us, you know. Cleveland Eaton? Mm hmm But anyway, that's the way it was. Quite often some things are not appropriate. They are done, not done appropriately. Well, you're always so... You like the way you were just so warm to Papa Joe Jones's memory. Just to say, you you have a politeness, a courtesy, a discipline to your politeness and courtesy. Um, let me re take you through those cities again, but let's do it a different way. If you might do it with us. When I was riding with you in New York City, you pointed out something about New York City that you liked. You were pointing out ice cream stores to me, and that, that there were many of them, and that was something you said about New York that that you appreciated, or at least were appreciating at that moment, that there was, you know, the Yum Yum there, and the Baskin Robbins there, and the Hagen Dazs there, and, and this, that, and the other thing. Taking you now back to Chicago, let's say, uh, what were things in the city that you appreciated and liked? Well, I appreciated the people fighting so hard against me, because <laughs> I overcame it, you know. You're talking to the experiences. I really, I really liked the challenge, and I was constantly overcoming them. It's good training for the world. Uh, when I came to New York, uh, something else happened. The building I was staying on 83rd Street, practically every night, it would be set on fire. Quite often, Ron Abarth <laughs> was coming late, and he'd be talking about the fire, putting out the fire. It was constant like that, so I told on the place about it. Why all these fires being set? He said, they're being set to run you out of New York. <laughs> I said, well, why do you want to do that? He said, your enemies. And I said, but I haven't even been here long enough to have any enemies. Oh, yeah. I said, who are my enemies? Are they white or black? And he answered, the whole world. Mm. Yeah, the whole world. And he was a so-called Jew. He said, the whole world. But he said, you, you stay in this building as long as you want to. Don't care what they do. You're welcome. And stay here and fight them. Now, he didn't say uh, well, he didn't identify why the whole world should be my enemies, but uh, that's what he said. <laughs> I had to put that together. I had to put it together, you see. And I've been able to put a lot of things together uh, lately, and I can see the whole pit. It was like a jigsaw puzzle. So I had to be gradually taught by another being as the way things in the correct manner. I see it now. I see things that the world don't see because, you know, the world is scattered in all languages. And, you know, to know all the languages. But anyway, the important words came to me. I put the important words together, just the essential things. And uh, I got it now. I see the picture of what's happening, like a jigsaw puzzle. And then after you put the jigsaw puzzle together, you turn it over because the other side of it means something different from the side you put it together. And that's what I did. I turned the jigsaw puzzle over, which, of course, is the Bible. The jigsaw puzzle. I put it all together, then I turn it upside down, and I know the answers. And I put it over the music. I'm speaking to the world through music, not because I want to, because I think the low profile is wonderful, and I can study more. I'm a scholar. I can study more when I'm not part of the world and learn all kinds of things. I know about this planet, what it needs me. But I can learn these other things about other planets and other universes, and it's fantastic, some of the things I've, I've seen and heard that make this planet like it's not anything How did all. How did you choose to lo relocate on this planet away from New York to Philadelphia? How did that come about? 
Well, it was they, they, these folks did it, you know. They uh, they did it. I didn't intend to leave New York, but uh, this house I was staying in, the owner of the house wanted to sell it to me, and uh, so somebody who was a musician who had been playing with us came up, named Walter Williams, and he came up. He got into real estate, so he looked at the house and he said. He said, this house is not worth that. You know, this is, you shouldn't buy this house. And since he's in real estate, I was perfectly satisfied with the house and everything. I didn't I didn't get it. And it was a big mistake. He was sent to keep me from getting that house. He was sent to get me out of New York. So then I went to Philadelphia, you know. And, um, and I was there, you know. I'm still there. Uh... It's a very strange place, but it is quite strange. Maybe they might wake up, you know, because they, they, they are going to have me on public broadcast, which they said I couldn't let y'all hear it up here. It's not coming on to May something. Is that May something to celebrate your your entry date into this uh, uh, land? No. It just happens um, to be a coincidence that it's May something? Yeah. Did you arrive in Birmingham, Alabama in the month of May? Yes. That would be... I, I suppose I did. <laughs> I don't remember being born or nothing like that. I probably was here all along somewhere. Uh, passing through sometimes, you and the orphans to seeing what they're doing, to learn more about them. And, you know, you have to be able to handle a situation. I've been trained by some forces to really take charge of a universe. I'm quite capable of setting it in order. And I'm quite capable of setting this plan in order, but as I said... Would you accept if we if we nominated you and elected you to office uh, on an Earth office, not a universal office, would you accept if we tried to run you for mayor of Philadelphia or I would president have, of the United States? I would, would you I accept? Would, I wouldn't have it. My job right now is to pick out some people and tell the governments of the world, these belong to the creator. Some of the musicians... These belong to the creator. Don't interfere. Because if they try to interfere, they get a message. <laughs> and that's why I have to do that now. In every nation, I go and say, this one, I'm taking this one. I have to do like death now. And death comes in the family and say, take them. And governments can't do anything about it. And when I come through to pick out some people, I'm going to say, you respect me like you do death. Death takes who is one. I'm going to take who I want. And that's the way it's going to be. I'm going to take who I want and say, this one belongs to me, I'm the creator. And death comes along and says, this one belongs to me. And all these churches and all these governments, don't, they don't offer any protection for their citizens. When I pick these, they will be protected. And then maybe the rest of the world will learn. Something has to happen on this planet that's utterly astounding and make everybody want to be part of it. Well, then, that's what I have to do. We're talking... All those people ain't worth two cents and a half, you know. I didn't make them. I wouldn't make nothing like that. But there are some folks that are really interested in people who sent me here. I was sent here. I'd like to ask you about some people who are interesting to us and certainly were associated with you. The clear, direct reference to a major jazz uh, band leader that you worked with in your early years is Fletcher Henderson. A lot of people know of that, and you've spoken of Fletcher Henderson tonight. Then there's Stuff Smith, who thankfully one of the recordings survives, and we've heard it. In, in in fact, the first time I heard it, you played it in this room, which was really something, another way of you giving the music when you brought it here for us so many well, years some ago. Some people I respect, like uh, Fess Watt in Birmingham, Alabama. Fess Watt, could you tell us about Fess Watt? Like, uh, the, the, he is. There are these educators, many of your musicians, and in a way, this is a linkage between because your musicians were trained largely by Walter Dyer at DeSabo High School, and you met one of the great black educators who organized a school system with music in Birmingham. He had a Fess band. Watley, and a band. And Wilson he, Driver still survives And I that. played with him, and he had this huge repertoire. Everything that was new came out, he had it. That's when I know a lot of show tunes and a lot of things other musicians don't know. Did you do that the summer tours with Fess Watley when he would leave Birmingham and during when school was out and you would come north and play somewhere across the summer months? Did you ever do that? No, he had Curly Parish playing with him. See, that was a school teacher's band. I, I was know. still a student. So therefore, I didn't belong in that band, 
but it happened that the uh, disagreement came against Curt in some way in, in Fesswiler, and he left, and he had he had this huge repertoire. He had to have somebody to sight read, and I I could do that. So. How did you gain your your music capabilities in a strictly legitimate uh, paper reading music sense? Who trained you, Fess Watley? No, I was playing. Uh, the creator taught me. I was reading without a teacher. My my mother bought me a piano. I came home about nine years old or early eight. I was in elementary school. I got it for a rival day present. And no one had taught me anything. I sat down and played it. And then I had a friend who played violin named William Gray. And he, he, uh, with some music up there, said, You can't play this. I played that. Then he brought some church music, put it up there. Play this. I played that. So every, I didn't have to buy any music for quite some time. Because every day he'd go out and buy classes and everything, he'd put up to play it and I'd play it. And he was still saying, You're playing by ear. But he went, he, he brought, all kind of things, they throw them brown. So I had a, a lot of music. I didn't have to buy any music. He was trying to find something I couldn't play, but I, would, I could play it. I was just a natural. Did you so. have the same e facility? Did you start reading, you know, the English language with the same ease that you began reading music, almost like from scratch? Uh, excuse me, pardon me for using that word again. <laughs> well, it's, it's all right to start from scratch, you know. Like I said, that's the devil's name, so... You own this planet, so why not? The next thing, uh, did you learn how to read I very read, easily, uh, just like that? Or well, when I went when I went to, to elementary school, you know, starting the primary grade, and I stayed in there about a week. Then they put me in the first grade. I stayed in there about a week, and then they promoted me to the second senior, and then after that. They promoted me to the fifth grade. Sorry. So I guess the answer is yes. Yes. I, I could read. Uh, you know, So I, I didn't go to the third grade and the fourth grade. They kept promoting me. So when I got to the fifth grade, then we moved on. I moved on up to the eighth and like that. And I went to um, junior high school. Then I went to high school. So I knew things. Sun Ra. On the Sun Ra Festival, WKCRFM New York. Phil Schaff in the studios. People are amazed just hearing about the facilities of the Sun Ra. I'd like to, before we go to some music, you've called Coleman Hawkins' name, Stuff Smith's name, Fletcher Henderson's name, Fess Watley. Fess Watley's name. A name, someone in the early years that you worked with and admired, or perhaps did not admire, but a name. Another one of your musical associations, a band you were a part of, just another. Avery Parish, who you were in, in my in, in the same place I was, and his first composition he wrote it because I wrote one, and uh -huh. uh, we were very good friends. You see. Avery Parish was a keyboard player, though. If you played with him, what did you play? Well, I mean, piano. In fact, I went to his house quite often. We played duets together. Uh huh. Four hands, one piano. Yeah. Wow. You didn't have recording devices then, though. No, you know, he was ill. He got hit in the head and everything. And so I went, this is a case where I went to try to rehabilitate. And I could have done it, too. Um, but unfortunately, he, he left that city. And he came to New York. And he was killed in a doorway here. So uh, they said he's mugged. Hmm. But, yeah, he's a good friend of mine. What do you think of After Hours, Avery Parrish's big hit? Oh, yeah, that's fantastic. I mean, he was always well-liked in school. Everybody liked Avery. He was a very likable person. He was very kind. Like his mother said, how could anybody hurt somebody like that? Mm. Because like she said, if if he saw somebody that uh, didn't have an overcoat, he'd give him his. His mother was talking about he's always doing something like that. If he had some shoes, didn't have any shoes, he'd give him that neat way his old shoes. He was very kind. In New York City, they said that during the Depression, he was always um, have food for other musicians to come up. So, but I mean, nothing protected him. Which other members of the Bama State Collegians, the famous musicians who became Erskine, which one other ones did you know as friends? In? Paul Baskin. Did Bert you play Baskin? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I played in Paul. Paul Baskin had a a band. I played with him and Doug Baskin. Uh, 
Yeah, some more. That was an early band. I played in Fred Avery, Society Troubadours, played him. Um, well, what about the band? A nice band. The, what about the band you brought to Chicago in late 1934? Was that your band? In a sense, it was. It wasn't a band that, to my. I mean, I liked everybody in the band, but it was forced upon me by the fellows in the band who wanted me to take. Oh, I didn't want a band, you know, because I, my low profile was was valuable to me. But they just imposed. They just said, "Well, you just our leader." It really had been Alpha Hopper's band. Uh, you know, she's a school teacher there, and then they were getting so teased because the woman was leading the band. Until they fell for it, uh, and they said, well, we have to have one of us. At least she brought a uniform and everything. She was dressed impeccably. She was all right, and I really resisted the idea. They were insistent, you see. Well, there were some folks that wanted to really get rid of the band. So when they did that, then there were some folks that wanted us out of town, and that's when we booked uh all up on around Carolina and Virginia and everything to get us out of Birmingham. Um, it still didn't work, you know. But finally, I got tired of the battle, and I went to college, you know, to get rid of a van. Uh, they followed me to college, you know, and I still got one. It just meant, you know, because mm -hmm. the creator knows that if I didn't have a van, I'd be in Egypt being a camel driver or something, staying on the desert. I wouldn't worry about the world, about them hearing me. I wouldn't do it. But I'm up on the, I'm in captivity by some folks that says, well, you have to do this. And so I have to. It's more than captivity. It's also because you love music. Well, I love music. When I, yes, I, I do. It's the only thing we're on this planet. Hmm. Well, let's it's hear pure, you know. Could you, is, yeah. could you tell us about this music you brought for us, the Wilbur Ware thing? Well, yeah, it, it really came down the house one day. Well, you know, in Chicago, we were always together playing. So then I was doing these other things, and he, he was interested. He was always said, just play the stand. I said, I'm not going to play the stand. Play what we play in Chicago. I said, I'm not going to do that. You have to play what I'm playing now. And so he came on down to the house one day, and I recorded that. It, it is, it's very nice. And so he was playing that thank God, you know. He played it. It sounds very nice. And uh, that's for instance, uh, Caesar Mike B is such a good friend of his. I told him I was going to uh, play that for him. Okay. So he can hear Wilbur playing Avant and God. And you know, you're playing on this too, is it? I'm playing on that. All right. Um, yeah, it's very nice. Okay. It's very interesting. It's quite different, you know, to hear him play what you might call Avant and God. Mm -hmm. You're listening to the sounds of jazz and a voice from the cosmos, the presence of Les Sun Ra here on the Sun Ra Festival, 116 hours of continuous radioactivity presenting Sun Ra's message and music, going around the clock till Tuesday morning, this Sunday night, midway or three-quarter mark, if you will, being spent with a visit from the presence himself. Les of course, uh, there were people like Jimmy. Dawson and you know, others that were doing some things <laughs> out of the show. I was familiar with, with everybody, Bart Rayborn. I was familiar with all band leaders because I was interested in band leaders. I was also familiar with all piano players, with Les Lewis, uh, all of them. So I, I could uh, appreciate what they were doing. It was from different sections of the country, and they played what they felt. Did you know Bud Powell? I never met him because, because I was in Chicago. Because he, he doesn't have too many quotes left behind because he was uh, he didn't say much, but he said, don't forget Boyd Rayburn, and you just called that name, band's name, too. Yes. Would you say it would be wise for, for people who like music on Earth to listen to Boyd Rayburn's band? Would that be okay? Of course it's all right, because every band has something to say. The good part about it is that you have men together who are not in an army to destroy people. They, it's something to have men working together for beauty and for precision and discipline, it's wonderful. It's the most wonderful thing about the planet that you do have men who are in armed force who have to be in there, but you have some more who are doing some other things that's not destructive, but unification and discipline, because they have to be disciplined to play music. If they're in a band, they got to listen to somebody. And that's what all men ought to learn 
that they need to listen to somebody because you take the basketball player, they got to listen. Listen, uh, prize fighters got to listen. Actors got to listen to a director. So I would say even every individual person needs to listen to somebody because successful people are those who listen to somebody and do as told or try to. I think what Sun Rogers said is that the best armies are the orchestras or the orchestras. And they certainly are. But we have a small group recording here of Sun Ra with Wilbur Ware, which Sun Ra brought for this festival, and which he dedicates towards Cecil McBee and shows Wilbur Ware in a different musical vein. An exciting episode in the musical career of Sun Ra. A visit by Wilbur Ware. Uh, was this in the Chicago period? No, that was in the Philadelphia period. That's fairly brief. He finally because, moved to Philadelphia. I know. He, he lived there the last decade or so of his life. So this would be in the 70s sometime, in the early Something or middle like 70s. That, yeah. Wilbur Ware, who, of course, had been associated in the Chicago period, uh, came to Sun Ra's in Philadelphia to play the music of Sun Ra of that time, to join with it freely and in tandem. We have a most remarkable recording, and you could clearly hear through the recordist, who also was Le Sun Ra, um, the separation because the bass was in the right channel, and you could hear Wilbur Ware playing uh, what Sun Ra referred to as avant-garde and playing freely as part of it. And uh, that was really a joy to listen to with you, and uh, thank you so much for bringing that music there with us. There's a, a bit more music that Sun Ra wants us to play, so perhaps... Uh, We'll get into some things that maybe we could walk through the career of Sun Ra with his presence here to amplify on certain points. You are listening to the Sounds of Jazz, the Sun Ra Festival, 116 hours of radioactivity here on radio station WKCR-FM, New York, 89.9 on the dial. Before I go back to the beginning, I'd rather jump into the middle, uh, Sun Ra. Could you ex remember for us your reception in New York when you arrived here in the early 60s and uh, the Monday nights at Slugs, the, the the formation of the choreographer's workshop at 414 West 51st Street. Can you tell us of these things? Well, the first time we spoke to the Charles Theater, I think everything was all right. And uh, Thomas Hunter at Bugs was playing drum. So I, I told him now, um, don't don't be leaving your drums in your car, you know. It's uh, got this important concert coming up, so you should uh, not leave them in there. So the night before the concert, he left his drums in his car. They took the car. They didn't take the drums, took the whole car. And there he was, he didn't have any drums. And although we had rehearsed and everything for our debut in New York, he didn't have any drums. So I had to hire another drummer that didn't know anything about what we were doing. He mostly was uh, on the African side, you know. New York musicians thought that's where I was, so they recommended him. So we played and everything. New York Times said, uh, so... That was in Ola Tunji, was it? No. Oh. We played the Charles we, we and uh, the New York Times said uh, that the musicians took out their weapons... And they began to play. That's what they said. Took the weapons out, and, uh, and they said we was playing like Alfred and different things. But we weren't doing that. But we had I had to take the band and move out sort of towards this drum. The one we had is they not obeyed, and they took the whole car because he got the car back and the drum laid on. But the point of it, there were those forces again that was embarrassing me, and. Uh, trying to make it sound bad, I would say, but it, it didn't happen. I kept on moving because I used my I used my spirit side, and it's always going to win, you know, so it did. Were there, any, were there any new musical influences for you upon your arrival in New York? I mean, your, your early influence is clearly a love for some major keyboard players, the people who, who you were affiliated with in, in Alabama and other places, and the big bands. What What had an input on your music could it affected your music in any way shape or form in the 60s it didn't because um they mingus i i saw him one day so he was saying you know that Catherine dunham wants some mu new music and i said why don't you play it he said no well that's not really what she wants what she wants is what you got 
and you go down there and you tell her I sent you. So I went out there. And so Catherine Donald told me to play. I was playing the piano. And she was dancing by what I was playing. And then it was what she wanted, so she sent for the drummers, her original drummers, about five or six of them. And they came, and I was. she said, well, now play. you play with him. So I played, and then the drummers, they were trying to, she was dancing. They was trying to get in there. They finally said they didn't know what what rhythm I was playing. And uh, she said, but I'm dancing by it. See? Uh-huh. She don't want to play. And say, I'm dancing by it. You musicians, why can't you play it? They said, we don't know. We just can't. It's another kind of idiom. And we've been all over the world with you. We've been in Africa. We've been in South America. We've been everywhere. The professional drama. But what he's playing, we cannot attach to it. We don't know what it is. So then again, she danced by it again. Say, see, this is the way it goes. And so that was it. They couldn't play with me. So that's when, uh, well, she had to. I'm sorry. I an idea. But uh, that's Mingus sent me that and said uh, that she would like it. And I had it. She had it too. But the music, again, the musicians did. The musicians who were with your orchestra, though, had it. And one question, something does appear to my ears. Now, I, I can very easily be wrong on this point. But it seems to me, after you come to New York, or perhaps even starting before then, but certainly in the 60s, the length of the solos in your performances grows, that you're now giving a longer period of time to the improvisations on the music of the orchestra to your leading soloists, including yourself. Oh, yeah, well, I did that. I'm going to do it even more extensively now that they uh, they got the ABCs of what I'm doing up to a certain point. But uh, I'm dealing with something that uh, is somewhere else. I got a folk photograph of John standing, looking at me, terrified. It's most remarkable. He's standing in the wings, terrified. <laughs> I, I don't know what I was playing or what I was saying, but the terror is there. He was afraid. So a lot of times, uh, sometimes I might say something to a musician or play something, and uh, like a, a tenor man is playing me in Europe, uh, Ronald Wilson, one night he told me, he said, you scared the hell out of me. And like another time in Chicago, a guitar player from Kansas City, last name was White, I was playing something, and he he uh, he practically fell off the stage when I hit this chord. And then they, another time at the Symphony Theater, I did hit a chord, and the two fellas playing the bells fell off the stage with the, uh, they said that chord, Sounded like the end of the world, and they were so scared they fell off the stage. So I've I've had I've had a, a lot of experience with music. Sometimes play something, and uh, like films I was playing in Cayman City one time, the Burlesque Club. The um, the MC had a skit called "The Man with the Glass Head," and we had two bands there, two small groups. The other piano player would play for him, you know. And uh, it happened that the other other piano player, the other group was over there in intermission for Charlie Ventura. So um, that made me have to play the music. So the, the, uh, the, the comedian got up and he announced that, well, he couldn't do his skit because he had a different piano player. He doubted whether I could play that music. So I hit a call on the piano. Everything jumped off the piano. The glasses, the um, the music, it hit the floor. When I hit that one chord, so he turned around, he looked, he said, well, you know, uh, maybe let's play what you want. I'm mm-hmm. going to do this skit. So then he went on and did it, and after he got through, he told the people it was better than the music he had written. What was the name of the comedian? Do you remember? I don't even know his name. It was in a burlesque club. Uh-huh. And, you know, he was a comedian, an MC. Um this would be the late forties in Chicago, then. Well, I don't know nothing about dates, but uh-huh. maybe so. Because I always played, I always played low profile, and that was very good because I was playing the Burlesque Club. I wasn't really being featured, although one night the folks just jumped over in there, and two men out there kept on hollering for 
for the pianist to play Claire de Lune, <laughs> and they, they had to stop the show. And um, and I had to play it, though, to play it. But I had it sitting right up there before me, you know. Is it true that Errol Garner heard you play Claire de Lune? Is that just part of the... Well, uh, he came to uh, Ferdinand when I was there. The waitress came in. Uh, it was really one of the most embarrassing scenes for me. And she came, she introduced me to Errol Garner, or she... And then she told him, now you sit right here on the front seat of Ergana and learn how to play the piano. Now Sunrise playing the piano, and you sit down here and learn how. And he didn't say nothing. He sit right on the front seat. Mm-hmm. So there's some truth to the thing, but you don't know whether you played Claire de Lune or whether that was. I don't know what I played during that um, that particular night. I was always doing something. I might. I had a nice arrangement on Claire de Lune. So it might be. So the whole story might be true. Mm-hmm. We you know it was before. It wasn't. It wasn't just for him. No. The people was in that in the club. This isn't just for, for me, but I'm thrilled to be here listening to Sun Ra speaking. My name is Phil Schaff. This is a live interview, a highlight, the highlight of our Sun Ra Festival. Sun Ra's presence in the control room has created some energy. The information is flowing. The music will be heard. I did meet Roy early in, in Cincinnati. I met Zach White. It really was meeting... Everybody, was, that was it. What did you think of Zach White's band? Well, he had a good band, Zach White and the Bobo Mills. Yeah. I never did hear them in person, but I did have some records. I knew about them. Let me, there, there are two questions I'd like to ask Sun Ra now. Let's start with records since you just mentioned them. Uh, did you, when you were growing up, did you have records? And did you continue to collect and listen to records across your career? And, and what are some records you might point us towards? I had all the records of all the masters. I had, because I had to, I was being guided. Nobody was teaching me about jazz, but I knew the masters. I first heard Charlie Parker. I knew that was it, J. McShann. And uh, you heard Parker on the McShann on the records. Record, McShann. Hootie Blues. Yeah, and uh, then I, I had uh, Duke Ellington playing jazz cocktail. Ah. And Lightning, and, and I had those records, and I had Fred Henson playing. Yeah, me and other things like that. I had Fats Waller. I had uh, Art Tatum. I had Mary Lou Williams. Mary, well, the whole thing. Which Mary Lou Williams Hines, did you have? Everybody, every pianist, I was listening because I was interested in jazz. And I learned, I could tell, when they were masters. I just knew that. Right. I met Dexter Gordon early, Gene Ammons, when they were playing with Billy King Colax. King Colax, wow. Was Coltrane I mean, in the they band? They came by the house. Huh? Coltrane in the band with Colax, and he wasn't there yet. I guess. Meet him. I just, uh, um, I just met those two. They came by the house. I met a lot of musicians who was quite often come to see me in Birmingham, and uh, I wasn't intending to to be in in music like that. But they did. They came now. In fact, uh, Bland, some musicians told me the bass player that should be with you is staying in Detroit. I mean, in Chattanooga. You should get him. I said, what's his name? He said, Blanton. And uh, they talked so much about him that finally I decided to go up there. But about two days before I was going up there, Duke Ellen picked him up. So he'd probably be alive today if I'd have picked him up. Yeah. Of course, they didn't take care of him. Sunrise. Duke himself said that they left him in this third-rate sanitarium. Did you meet uh, people like Thelonious Monk? Did you know him? Yeah, I met him. In fact, I went to his house. One day, the Baroness took me there, and uh, she was playing this. She took the record there. She was playing this record, and Phil Lund was laying in the bed. She asked him, uh, what do you think about that? It was your record. Mm-hmm. His wife said, it's too far out. <laughs> the Alonia said, but it swings. Ooh. That's a nice compliment. So we've isolated uh, some of the records you had during a, a growing up period or initial period in your being here. Included uh, the Fletcher Henderson Blue Label Deckers with Yeah Man and uh, and uh, I guess you had Queer Motions. You must have had that. Uh, I had that. I met Freddie Webster. He played with Fletcher. You met Freddie Webster. Maybe two nights. And then he but died. I heard that he, he died. 
uh, while he's in Chicago. I don't know how true that was. That's probably why he didn't uh, continue playing with us. When Freddie Webster played with Fletcher Henderson, you weren't there. Yes, I was there. You were there those two nights. Yes, and Club Delisa. They said he was featured on Body and Soul, and it sounded beautiful. Could you? Yeah, he really played wonderfully on everything. I was quite thrilled by it because I had some of his records, too. And I knew he was a master, but unfortunately, um, they don't play his records or anything like that now. But he did some beautiful things. Oh, they're beautiful. It doesn't matter. Just things happen where a lot of masters came through here, and it didn't stay too long. He's one of them because he was over in <laughs> the record... some dope or something, they said. And yeah, that's, that's what, what happened. they say. He died, he played uh, the 31st of March and the 1st of April of 1947 with, with uh, Fletcher Henderson's orchestra, which also means since you were there that you were with Fletcher Henderson on those days. What, what year was that? 47, March 31st and April 1st of 47. Oh, that's interesting. Uh, Freddie, the Freddie Webster records that you referred to, were those the ones with Sarah Vaughan that you mm, knew no, about? No, he was playing something, some fast numbers, a very... Fast number with the Lunsford band, maybe mm, like band, a, a, a group, a small, small group, like Frankie Sokolo, uh, the man I love, and uh, uh, reverse the charges, his own tune. You, you can't no, remember. It was, it was, it was something else. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, I don't know what it was, but I remember it if you call it. But it was very good. Both sides were fast. Uh huh. Both sides were fast. Mm. It was fantastic. Sonny Boy Williams, he made some sides on Decca. They're great recordings too. Savoy is jumping and reverse the charges. They're both fast. Mm. Well, we'll have to play all the. We'll have to get all the Sun, Sun, Freddie Webster records to Sun Ra. We're talking with Sun Ra on the festival WKCR FM New York eighty nine point nine on the dial. Uh, an interview that is uh, free form but touching many important musical bases. After the records, you know, you mentioned Claire de Lume. We heard you earlier tonight playing Prelude in C sharp minor. In the classics, the classical composers. Who impresses you? Where where do you hear something that you can feel and enjoy? Well, I, all of them, because I can, I can. Well, what they play is the soul of that nation. And so, if we want to know about a Russian, you listen to the, the musicians who are expressing uh, that Schoenberg and the Ryabin, uh Stravinsky. All of them had something to say. Russia has really offered quite a lot to the world in, in music and composers. And, but Scriabin is is uh, the one that interests me most. In fact, I got a package about uh, six months ago, and it had on on the outside uh, from Scriabin, and uh, it was a uh, some manuscript as hard as it. it said from Scriabin to Sunrise. Really, I still got it. Out. It's right. That's beautiful. And hey, Scriabin. Then it had the date he was born and the day he died down uh -huh. the so and so and so, and it came through the mail. And up there, it has from Kriyabin. My word. So that was very... And tree, in fact, when it was Christmas, I got a card, and it said from Fletcher Henderson. You got one of those Christmas cards that he used to set out with the pictures then? I think so. Uh, yeah, picture was on there. Yeah, and it said that was Fletcher. his calling card. It yeah. said from Fletcher Henderson. So I don't. Um, it's something else happening around me. You know? right. and I'm the, able to accept any impossibility at this point. How about the uh, uh, the non-Russian 20th century composers uh, or early 20th, late 19th? W.C. Uh, yes, I used to play. Well, yes, yeah, kind of some more things he had too. Beautiful pianistic, you know. Mm -hmm. And Brahms and Beethoven, all of them, I I played uh, that. We're talking with Sun Ra, a live interview on the Sun Ra Festival. Phil Schaap in Master Control with a lot of people whose eyes and ears are uh, perking up as each of these new revelations come our way. Um, you know, one question that we didn't attend to, uh, perhaps we can make it more broad-based, the Choreographer's Workshop, 414 West 51st Street, was that yours or something you came to? And and, and when did the dancing and the other non-instrumental performers come into the orchestra presentations? Was it through that? Well, the band can reach a certain level and they can't go any further because they've been educated on the earth plane. So that's when I started moving on the cosmic plane. They, can't, they can play up to a certain degree. Then I have to lead to movements or to silence. Because silence speaks too. 
and dances. The person can express some with their hands and their eyes like they do in the East. And therefore, if I want to say something, I had to have dancers too. And they could they could take up where uh, the musicians couldn't go any further. Now, we just if I can go, they can connect a little better now. Because I'm, I'm really expressing things on a vast cosmos level. And if people on this planet haven't been taught about it, it will, sound, it will frighten them, maybe. It was frightening them. Like, for instance, when I first moved to Philadelphia, sometimes some teenagers from high school would come by there. The recess, the person brought them by there and said, you know, now I want you to listen to some, uh, listen to this music. Uh, your head's going to hurt first. It's going to really hurt, but you will have like a headache. But just keep on listening. It'll go away. So there you are again. This case where something was happening to them in the head where it would hurt seemingly. Uh, let it go away. So that's because I said probably because they had never used their brain before. I was activating that brain, and it hurt. You know, when you use an organ that you haven't used before, and the teenagers today, <sighs> they, they never use their brain. It's just like, for instance, like when I was going to college, we had a biology teacher named Mr. Hamilton. He'd always say, well, you know, man got two brains. He got one at the, at the base up top of his backbone and one at the bottom of his backbone, and he never used the one at the top. I found out quite true. <laughs> Sun Ra. <laughs> uh, here are a series of questions that have been offered from uh, other members of uh, our KCR staff. Uh, we have one from Elliot Bratton. He's referring to uh, Notes and Tones, uh, written by noted drummer Art Taylor, Arthur Taylor. Uh, That's where you got the item from. Okay, that's the first part of it. Go ahead, take it from there. Well, he he was talking to me in Paris, and I told him, if you take notes and permutate it, you got T-O-N-E-S. So that's why he used the title. All right. Here's something. I, I'll start off with a question of my own and bridge it into the station's question, which is, you record vast amounts of your orchestra's performances. Uh, how do you decide what's going to come out on Saturn Records? Whatever I think people are not going to listen to, I always <laughs> recorded it where it would take them some time to maybe 20 years, 30 years before they'd really hear it. And I recorded that deliberately because I said, I'm not a politician. I'm not a minister. I'm not anything that this planet honors. And so therefore, I didn't want to go through that starving in the attic and all that foolishness on artists. I know I'm an artist. So I wanted to bypass that particular trauma they put on artists. And <laughs> are, sure enough, I have had difficulty. Are the Saturn records still in print? Is there a way for us to, to obtain them through you still, like they used to be with the Saturn Address and Saturn Research in Chicago? Well, they're possible, but you know, it's sort of going underground <laughs> just for a select uh, few people because, see, something happened in Boston that made me be um, more wary. Because a fellow up there named Bill Sebastian, and we worked together. He, he's an villain. And um, one night, Bill had, he's playing a record called I, I, Pharaoh. But he's also making a video with a color machine, putting the two together. He said, all at once, when he put, when he put the colors together, he could feel in my talent, right at the point when I said, I have, I don't have anything to offer this planet immortality. He said at that point, he felt the touch of immortality. He actually felt it. And then he went and he played the tape back over. It was gone. And after that, well, well, another thing happened. He got this machine where he plays, color machine, done, got a keyboard, done making the sound, just make color. And he was always trying to get these rhythms and things what I'm doing to put it synchronized. He had great difficulty. He'd be totally dissatisfied with himself about mixing it. So one night, I decided to play it over. I said I wasn't going to play it. 
because in order to play it, you have to put this uh, electronic bracelet where the electric current comes uh -huh. to your body into the machine. And I said, I wasn't going to do that. But he was so desperate for and disappointed about what he's doing, I decided to play it at the Massachusetts Institute, top card. He said, so when I was playing it, all the ones, all the clocks in the universe had stopped at different times. Now, one clock was going like this when I was playing. And uh, then stopped. And everyone, um, it took them about a month to fix the clocks. So what happened? My my spirit went over into the, into the electronic system. It stopped time. So after that, I, I said I wasn't going to play the instrument anymore. But it's a fact that it did stop time. So I'm I'm another kind of being. You see, I'm I'm representing something this planet has never heard about before, and I know it. But it's in a serious condition, and some folks sent me here to say this is the way. Do this. This is the way to avoid this after. So you know they got all that stuff fit together. These colleges and this. They might listen. They might not. I'm not supposed to persuade them. They have to make up their minds. So they want to survive or they willing to bow to death. They're going to do one or the other. No more fence sitting. And I'm not righteous either. So therefore, if I was righteous and all that, they'd probably follow me like they follow Kamini over there in Iran. They probably would. <laughs> but I'm not. Mm -hmm. I'm not interested. That's not my department. I'm representing something else that affects every nation on this planet, and that's the part that's got me slowed up because all these nations are bad as far as I'm concerned. I mean, they're bad and they're violent, and they, they, they're going the wrong way, and their opinion is horrible. But I've been to a lot of different countries, and every country, really, basically speaking, I find that people were very pleasant. Tell me, uh, Sun Ra, uh, switching now to the music and the, the being that is your orchestra, what do you, could you do anything with a statement to parallel in your music of the cosmos the experiences of yourself and the orchestra to the history of the Duke Ellington Orchestra in terms of, let's say, the reed section being together for so long and, and, a, and a longevity of composition and presentations? Uh, do you feel any kinship in that respect? But Duke used some of my... My musician, you know, he used Pat Patrick. Yes. And he used uh, Nelson Williams, the trumpet player. Mm -hmm. He also used uh, Roy Burns, who's playing with me now. Uh, he knew about me, so did his son. Mercer. Mm -hmm. Mercer. He knew. When did you have Nelson Williams? In the 40s, in your earliest? Uh, in Birmingham. In Bur that early? That's where he came from. At least that's where I, I met him. It's a wonderful musician in Birmingham. Birmingham. He's in that band that came to Chicago then. The one no, no different one. No, he was sort of like on he's playing so much till a lot of people didn't consider him to be using him like Fetz Wiley. He wouldn't have used him. You know, Birmingham was sort of like a, an aristocratic uh center. It was really society. In fact, while I was there, I never did play in what you call a tavern. I played for social clubs, mm. black ones. Uh, who who had their social clubs, and they'd be together, and they'd rent a place. And every week you had a social fact go to with the tuxedos and the eating drink. And that's what it was. It was another kind of society. It was in a white world, but it was some people that were together, and they were very beautiful. But when I came to other cities, it wasn't like that. They didn't have what Birmingham had. They had taverns and all like that, nightclubs, and I wasn't used to that. I was used to playing for society uh, things. Let's. We're talking with Sun Ra. This is Radio Sun Ra, WKCR FM, New York. This is a live, ongoing interview. Sun Ra has some music that uh, we're going to get to at the conclusion of this interview that uh, he feels is very important, which he made a special effort to literally, physically bring to us as well as prepare for us. Uh, perhaps we could, since. I'm a little bit too much with the dates, and you're not. Let's go backwards uh, through some of the points that we've touched on. Is there a possibility that you will be some sort of cultural official in Europe? Is there some talk of this? What, this is a recent news. Uh, 
Can you talk of that? Well, it's over in the International Herald about it. And uh, you mean the International Herald Tribune, the paper? Yeah, yeah. And it had some statements in there about you know psychic things. Like they put it in there, and then they mentioned about France, and France said, "Well, it just it was so expensive now." What I wanted to do, so they they backed down, off of because of expense. But they be spending millions of dollars for defense, and the greatest defense is beauty, and art, and culture. Something that is often some worthwhile nations instead of bullets, and they, and that's the greatest. So they should spend some money for that. They still talking about it, you know. First, they didn't realize that, but they've been trying to you know, copy it and play it, and they, the cards are different and in between the cracks and all that, so they finally had to write me. Well, I write it for them. Well, I know pianists myself. I used to always look for strange art uh, compositions. That's when I know about David Rose and all, everybody because I was really sincerely looking for something different. I knew, I, I knew somebody doing something beautiful. And I spent a whole lifetime looking for those kind of people. So I know about a lot of things that other musicians don't know. But beauty and sincerity is important to me because it's quite discouraging if you read the news or look at TV and all that and you, you hear about these dreadful things and uh, you need something to um, to let you know that beauty is still superior. You have some beautiful people in the orchestra. Could you speak of them individually, the Pat Patricks, the people who are with you? Well, yeah, well, it comes down to a point of people making up their mind. Pat been with a lot of a lot of different groups. It always comes a time where I ask a person, I might say, what do you want most out of life? And that's the moment for them, whatever they say. It will happen. Because you see, like, one time in Chicago, the MC stopped the show, plays packed with people, and said, John Gilmore, step forward. So John came out. And, what do you want most out of life? Stop the show. And John said, I like to travel. But I always be telling John, but you didn't ask for any money, John. Can you talk a little bit about so Marshall? Then, Go ahead. You just have to be careful with what you're saying. I, I wasn't too careful. I said I wanted to help this planet, and the Creator sent me the means of doing it. Sorry I said it at this point. And I look at these teenagers, and they, 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 they can't nobody control them, but it's a possibility, a strong possibility I can. Some I don't be around them much, but I know... Some sub teenagers, one day I was sitting in the park in Harlem. Some sub teenagers came by, about 12 of them or more, and they was over there, they, you know, talking to one another. I was sitting on this bench. They passed by, you know, and went over in another corner, past me and left. They was over there talking and whispering one another. Finally, one of them came over to me and said, uh, We were discussing you. Are you, are you our brother? And I said, what do you mean by that? I said, sometimes a brother uh, is someone initiated over into a secret order. You know, then some of them were born brothers, but which one do you mean? So then he went back. He went back over there to them. And then he came by me. All of them filed past me again. And the last one came and said, we've decided that you are our brother but you know, we don't have anything to give you but this. And they gave me a matchbox. <laughs> they said, that's all we have. But they gave you. You have a brother. Another time in, in Philadelphia, I was going up to catch up the elevator. And uh, it was a passage that you had to go through from one side to the other way. It's a tunnel. And you could nobody see you. It was about. Seven teenagers out there, eight. And all of us, when I got in there, they ran and they surrounded me. And then one of them said, but he's our brother. And they left. But they had me really surrounded. 
but that's what they decided. So that's twice where it happened. You know, it happened twice. Uh, and in Germany, this when a German woman said I was going to get all the teenagers in the world, and they were going to do what I said. I said, well, I don't ever be around them. As far as I'm concerned, they'll chip off the old block, and the old blocks ain't no good. <laughs> so why would you do? He said, yes, that is going to happen. And she said it before uh, 2,000 people. What did you What did you know about, and what did you make of Papa Joe Jones, who also was one of the great musicians to come out of Birmingham? Oh, well, he was really playing something different. He had a sense of humor, <laughs> and uh, remarkable, you know. We're talking with. We had this Sonny. I'm sorry. He, he was playing, playing it on his drums. He was playing Sonny on his drums. I mean, see? Sonny disposition. He's <laughs> playing it. <laughs> Sonny disposition. Was he playing Sun Ra? Well, he he didn't know too much. He left Birmingham, went with Count Basin with uh, maybe Moten. Um, Benny Moten, you mean? Maybe with him. Yeah, I think with Lloyd Hunter. But uh, yeah, he left Birmingham and he went. So I didn't know too much about him. I was still in high school. We're talking. But I knew I knew about him. Mm-hmm. I didn't know too much. Like Teddy Hill, he came to Birmingham. He was in New York playing on the NBC quite often. I used to listen to him. He had a wonderful band. It was really together. Uh, people don't say much about him, but his band, I would say next to Fletcher Henderson, he would be the one, I would say, that really had his band. It did Dizzy played with him. Yeah. In fact, on those NBC broadcasts, I that's think Dizzy. Berry, I think Chew Berry played with him. Yeah. Russell Procope, Chew Berry. Um, it was wonderful. Sometimes, Bob Carroll, a tenor sometimes player who also, call, I think, is from Birmingham. Bob Carroll, the McCordans are from, uh, uh, but not, he left early and he was older. Not for me with him. But, uh, yeah, they, it was wonderful. So, see, I would listen to the very best without anybody telling me what was the best. I just knew. Mm-hmm. Uh, a couple of questions about the 60s, and then uh, uh, we'll jump. We'll walk it through one more time. Uh, the jazz composers of new, new music, new sounds of the 60s, they formed an organization, JCOA, in the in 63. They gave some pivotal co- concerts, and then there was this October Revolution. What, and also in your, in your Chicago area, there's the AACM. What, what, what was your interplay with them, and what did you think of the music? Well, they were talking different things, Dollar Cecil Tales and Archer Shepard and all that. We'd be sometime at 4 o'clock in the morning talking about the, the the commercial forces wasn't doing anything about music and all that. And then uh, we decided to give some affairs, you know, to raise some money for the treasure. And then I was the one who had to put the advertise. I made advertise. I did the same thing for them I'd done for my band. I had individual advertise. Uh, it's special. And I, with my own hand, I fixed it up. And then the band, my band bought beer and stuff for the parties they're going to have. And nobody else did anything but talk, 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 talk. So finally, um, man, Wall Street sent for us. And, and uh, the man said, you know, you're perfectly right about the commercial photo system. And you're right. They need to do something about music. I give grants in New York. We're ready. But the rest of the fellows, but before was there, Paul Blay, Roswell Rudd, Alan Silver and myself. He said, Where the rest of the fellows? Now they did all that. They didn't show up. They knew about it. So then I said, Well, they're not here. He said, Well, you can get this money, you know, a million or two million dollars for the really to do something about the music. They're not here. He said, Now, well, what you have to do, you select or elect one of you as the leader, and we uh, you can get this money. So then they couldn't decide who to pick out. To be the leader, Paul Blay said, well, you know, we're doing, we're on the freedom thing, so we don't have no leader. And all that the man said, well, okay, what I do is uh, I make myself the leader, and we still can get this money. You ha- you can't get anything without a leader. Once somebody has to be appointed, so you can do that. That's where we do business. Uh, so I said, no, if musicians don't expect uh, one of their own enough to be to do that, Forget the millions. I don't want to be part of it. So we didn't get the millions. But I meant that I think musicians should stick together and support one another. And then people will follow the lead. But as long as they can't respect one another, 
Well, they can't res- expect the world to respect them. And that's what's got to happen in America. They got to follow one person. One person is the leader. Did you go to their concerts, though? The JCOA thing? The Summer Garden well, I concert? I'd be at every concert. See if they're stealing some of my stuff. But um, <laughs> I had to see what they were doing, you know. Speaking of stealing your stuff. Do, do you feel that this whole rekindling of interest in these kind of weird recordings, I don't mean weird because it was abstract in its musical conception, but it was sort of like uh, filtered down Hawaiian music, filtered down Calypso music that they call now referred to as exotica, and there's something of a revival of it. There was a lot of pop exotica in the 50s, but you were you were creating what might be called the most centralized and, and authentic presentations of Exotica in the 50s, to my ears. Well, some folks in America have been trying to do everything but respect me and do what is supposed to be proper. They've been doing it a long time. Of course, it uh, is at an end neck of it isn't. I'm just going to take this position that's been offered me at Moscow University and go there and teach the Russians because I got it all in my hand and I don't have to stay in America and I'm a master musician and I can teach any nation to play jazz the way it's supposed to be because I'm a master. So then I don't have to go begging in America by, please accept me. They need me more than I need them. They don't have nothing but money. I got spirit. And I got the creed on my side. I got everything on my side. Like I told the white person on the other side, I got, I got Satan, Lucifer, the devil, and God, and the angel of death on my side. What do you have? So they didn't say anything. Of course, that was nothing to say. Well, perhaps we should restate some things that we know about. Is it safe to say we're talking with Sun Ra? This is the festival. We're going around the clock till Tuesday morning, the 21st. We've been on since Thursday. We've been here for several hours with Sun Ra himself. The music, the presence, uh, the preferences, and uh, a strong way of presenting cosmic neutrality. You were placed here in Birmingham, Alabama, in the month of May, around 1915 or so. Well, probably safe, safe about to... uh, the year 1055 or something. Ten... I, I'm just in arrival on this plant, you know. Right. I've been around quite some time. You might call me the Ancient of Days. I'm not of any generation, because where I was, I couldn't play the music I'm playing. Right. And the cosmic voice reached you as you were considered three in Birmingham. Well, I came from somewhere else. But and that, then that it, voice then it reached you. me through this, uh, the maze and the dullness of human existence. It still could reach me because I'm pure and sincere. But if I hadn't been, it couldn't have reached me. I'd be like the rest of the people on this planet who are dancing and and, uh, and their and wisdom is, is ignorance as far as I'm concerned. And they can't, nothing can get through to them because of the denseness they in, the grossness they in. But it did, it did reach me because I came from somewhere else, and where I came from reached me, and still reaching me, and it makes everything here um, nothing. It doesn't mean anything to me because they, it's not where I, it's not like where I came from. So I'm looking at at something else. If I didn't know something else. This could be a very good planet. You can have a lot of pleasure with dope and sex and religion and different A lot of pleasures on the airplane. But I know something else better because I've been part of it. That makes the difference. If I hadn't been part of something better than what's here, I could accept this as the ultimate. But I came from somewhere else. And where I came from, I was part of something that's so wonderful that no words to express it. And that's still embedded in me. Are you going to be allowed to go there again? Well, and is there jazz there? Jazz is what the creator likes. Jazz is the main music then of the cosmos. It's creative and it's, that music came from the creator directly. The rest of the stuff that's sad <laughs> and sanctimony, he doesn't like that. And the Bible says so, where they got God saying, I hate your music. But see, of course, they don't read the book. But in the book, plain says, man, I hate your music. But the Creator likes my music. In fact, every time where if we're not working anything, and I say, well, put up my instrument so I can play for the Creator. And uh, the other day, I hadn't rehearsed for quite some time. I told Danny, put up my instrument. 
He put the instrument up while I was playing and watching DC Kong. Wants to play four days of the theater. And Dan said, You know, I'm, I'm beginning to see what you're talking about. You know, you mentioned several times, not just this evening, about the big bands being a major something you're majorly impressed with. There's so many sounds, so many voices. Sometimes they sound like two, sometimes they sound like one, sometimes they sound like everybody's doing something individually. Did you did you strive, uh, you started with, when you first started your first bands, did you strive to have as many sounds as possible and then kept adding pieces to get those sounds? Is that how it worked? Well, no, what happened in the Deep South, a black people on a very oppressive region of Southern, well, they were made to feel like they weren't anything. So the only thing they had or we had was big bands. Unity, showing that some black men could be together, dressed nicely, doing something nice. And that's all they had. So big bands were very important in the South, and big bands made most of their money in the South when they traveled down there because they were supported by black people. And... um most of the time, they didn't have to play for white people. So, so therefore, it was important to us to hear big bands. Somebody that the world would say, they're all right. It was very important. And that's where big bands were important to me. Uh, trios and like that. Well, we had that, you know, good piano players. So what? But big bands was something else. And that's, that's really uh I know the importance of big bands now, and I know that the black race is practically defunct now because they don't have big bands. Now, at one time they did, but there were some people who deliberately broke up the big bands, some ethnic group. Uh, they, they just they felt that, like they didn't want black people to have no dignity or nothing. So they went and broke up the big bands. Now you don't have but one that's created, and that's me, because... Uh, it's impossible for them to stand up against the forces I represent. So they have to reestablish uh, culture instead of putting these black folks in jail and all that and killing them. They need to establish cultural things so that they wouldn't have no trouble out of black people. But they have to have something to hold on to. They must have something to hold on to. And what is that? Creative things, and they can appreciate it. But otherwise, where they mug and rob and steal and dope and all that, it's very expensive for this country to have a people like that. But they should give them their freedom to doing cultural things their way, musically wise, whatever, to express themselves creatively in America would not have a burden like black people are on. They would not have it. Because like they said, a doc is born, but he's no good, no how without a song. Sun Ra speaks here on WKCRFM New York. Can I go to before your band was the full size when it was three pieces and the four voices you wrote for? Could you describe that music for us and what your lyrics may have contained in your choral parts? Well, about space, you know. It Unless, was about space then, too. Yeah, it was about space. That's what the trio was, Pat. It's about, so I want a space trio, you know, for my own edification and for my own pledges because. I didn't find being black in America a very pleasant experience, but I had to have something. And what was that something? It was me creating something that nobody owned but us. And that's where it started. And that's the way it is now. I got a treasure house of music that no one has. The Arabs got oil. The Africans got tin and fruit and all that. And all these nations got something. I have music from the creator which is more valuable than anything they got now, of course they got their religions and all that but this is more valuable than that it comes to the point where is man a thinking creature or he's the big dummy that he seems to be it's at that point if he's a big dummy without any feeling and all that he would be eliminated off the planet earth because he, the creator has no need for him if he can't be uh if he can't be of help to himself, if he's self-destruct, we're leaving out the age of self-destructiveness. He's got to change the possibility. 
it's a possibility he might. That's the I'm on the planet. He might. Because I got this planet in judgment and saying, look, I'm in human form. If they can't recognize me and I'm representing innocence and beauty and sincerity, then they're hypocrites and they don't fit in this omniverse. But if they're sincere, they recognize me as sincere, and that would mean they are sincere. But if they try to bypass me, they through. I can tell them that. They could, they're through because I'm representing the living God, and I don't have no church and nothing like that. But as for the Spanish son, my word is law with the Creator because we are very good friends. Mm-hmm. And if I tell him to say this plan, he will. Now they can believe that if they want, and they cannot because it is no concern to us. We have control. And with all this confusion, we, and by we, I mean me and the Creator, we have control. The Creator asked me one day, uh, are we the only ones that's just, just us, never nobody else? Is it lonely for you somehow? Well, it's lonely on this planet. But now, now it ain't lonely when I commune with the Creator. To, but to, it's lonely otherwise because I don't have anybody who think like me. And they can't talk spiritual things like me because they don't know the book. Right. And they don't know. They just don't know because this planet has always been in darkness. Well, let, let's switch then to something that's a much smaller, perhaps much, much, much more mundane, but it's something that we've talked about and perhaps with many more people listening now because this is the Sun Ra Festival. This isn't just a one day in the presentations of your music. You you spoke with me once about records you think you've made that were issued in the late 40s in Chicago and the, they would be part more of the music before you started recording yourself. Uh, could you give us some details about that so we can search for them? Yeah, a lot of things out. I'm on in other names, you know. Yeah. The creator got my music out there. And in case they want to block me in one name, he got some more things out there. But you that pl- I'm totally unaware of. Like it's something where, where I'm playing with the Deuce of Swing. Everybody Europe knows about it. I never heard the record, but I'm supposed to be on it. So uh-huh. he, uh, yeah. Well, you do, what records are you on that you remember making in the late forties? Any? I might have made some Fletcher Henson. I really was busy with my spirit thing. I didn't care. I wasn't even here. I was here and wasn't here, so I didn't take any note of things that were happening around me. But I'm sure they have them because of Wilson. Like Coleman Hawkins when I was with him and stuff. Smith. When were you with Coleman Hawkins? Is that Chicago in the 40s? Chicago. Well, I don't know what it is. Okay, what but was it the Downbeat in Chicago? The, the what, what? The, what club? The Downbeat in Chicago? Which one was it? That's the thing about it. I don't even, I was on the north side, which uh-huh. I never played over there. But Stuff Smith, hey, I was playing with him. Mm-hmm. And so when they put Coleman Hawkins with him, he hit me because Coleman had to come in town. So during this time, he was there. It was some people there making pictures constantly with these big cameras and there with the lights on. And somewhere in Chicago, somewhere, they got pictures of me and Stuff Smith and Coleman Hawkins together. Uh-huh. Somewhere. But I don't know who they were. Mm-hmm. They could have been from Europe, but they had all the equipment and they was constantly making pictures of us. It's somewhere. And there are a lot of, also there are a lot of records somewhere of me with other groups. Right. Somewhere well, in Chicago. Of course, it is surface, you know. There was one group that you mentioned in particular, but you can't call their names now. Well, Jesse Miller, I played Jesse with him. Jesse Miller, yes. He's a wonderful trumpet player. He was on the bop. He's from Birmingham, too. He'd always be teasing me when I said, I'm going downtown. He'd always say, downtown? This, all of Chicago is downtown. <laughs> well, we got some people here in the room. Perhaps uh, one of the gentlemen who has been so nice to us here at KCR, and I know has been nice to you in all your returns to New York. Tom Goes Hunter, one, anything we should ask Sun Ra? Because one thing I want to say oh, Sun Ra was to Lionel Hampton. You know, one time Lionel Hampton, he was always telling his band, according to Walter Miller, but a great band I hate. He's always telling the fellas about it. So finally, he, he called me up and everything. He wanted me to dress up in spaces, he and I, and had this big press party, at I think at the showboat here in New York. And I didn't go, so I know he might have felt that I ignored him. But it wasn't that. Um, it just wasn't time, you know. I know he felt bad about it, like I ignored him, and he was trying to help me. But then I wasn't trying to be uh, seen by people. I was trying to be the invisible person. Hmm. 
So, because I'm not man, you know, I'm an angel. And then they used to making that mistake just because I'm a human farm. Uh, they make a mistake and don't judge me like they would a man, but I'm here for the interests of humanity. Would you like to play with Lionel Hampton? Once, I mean, or maybe more than once? I'd be delighted. Then the Carter told me, the next time I give a hundred piece of Van Con, don't forget him. I agree. And he wants well, to, from my two he cents wanted to be in it. So, you know, it, it uh, probably, so he was very thrilled about it. And so was uh, Teddy Wilson, who I'd never met. But he was sitting in Russia, and he said, oh, that's Sun Ra. So he got up, stopped eating, and came and shook my hand. And he said, keep on doing what you're doing. He knew about angels and demons at play, Teddy Wilson. He did? He did. He said something about it? Yeah, he, well, he heard it. Oh. The album. He mm -hmm. heard it on, well, he heard it. Mm -hmm. Well, a lot so of things. So that may have kindled his interest in you. They started putting things together. They'd be surprised at the testimony I've given to the fact that a person in human form can do Beautiful things. You know, jazz still seems to be very important. I mean, the the things that seem to... I mean, I'm excited because Sun Ra's here, and Sun Ra is is an amazing figure to me. But the amazing figures, if we might draw some attention to them, they, you, you you were Teddy Wilson, uh, Coleman Hawkins, Stuff Smith, the, the, the figures. These legends who you recognize as masters without having to read it in a book are still important to you. I got a picture of me and Earl Hines together, too. And it's still important And one of the to Nichols you. brothers, too. He knew mm -hmm. about me. A lot of things, you know. But I said, I'm, I'm more than what you call a musician. In fact, I'm thinking of just not calling myself a musician, calling myself a tone scientist or something else. Because I don't think musicians get proper respect in this country. So I realized... And you take, I went to Mexico, and the musician union blocked me from playing this theater, although I was booked in the El Dago, I think the El Dago Theater. Advertising the paper and everything. The government brought me that. The musician union stood up and fought against me. So then we were there two weeks trying to to play, and finally, I, I really got very angry about the situation where musicians blocking a musician, and I'm representing, I'm a master musician. So, the Actors Union stepped in, and they said, well, Sun Ra is an actor, and it could play in our name. And we did. The Actors Union stepped in. So I found out I had to get more respect in music. <coughs> so I don't just, like, I don't think Dexter Garden got no respect until he got the made a picture. Uh-huh. Well, I mean, he should have won the, the Academy actors, Award. Too. The actors respected him. You see what I'm talking about? Yes, they did. But musicians have never gotten together and said, well, we will give some in honor of Dexter Gordon. The music in this country have never gotten together and honored somebody together or had a press party, anything. They never have done it. And yet, other sports and things do recognize the ones who are superior. And it's really time for musicians to respect well, it's just our, it's just our 116 hours of radioactivity, but it is our offering here from the station. Well, some of them have, for you. have called me utterly amazed, you know, so maybe maybe, maybe they'll wake up. Uh, I hope they do. They need to. We're talking with Sun Ra live on the Sun Ra Festival. Phil Schaap here in Master Control with uh, the entourage is still here, and I'm supposed to ask some questions for the... Uh, they, they would yell at me if I didn't ask you about the, <laughs> bat, the Batman record. Oh, Can the you... Batman record. I did make uh, the Batman record that became popular. I was playing the organ on there. I don't even know what name they put on it, but I was playing the organ on this Batman record, the one that got famous. Mm -hmm. And I made it in New York with, uh, under the auspices of Ed Bland, who came from Chicago, who made a movie there, too, um, about jazz. Uh, he made the first, but he was saying the movie Jazz is Dead, oh, had that thing. But he was quite wrong, you know. Mm -hmm. But I made I made the record. It was the first documentary of, of me in the band. Spencer Weston has been with us and has, of course, been with you a lot. Is there anything we should ask, Sun Ra? Well, Spencer is very interested in jazz, and uh, he's done quite a bit for it in Philadelphia. Anything we should ask, Sun Ra, before we play the music, the new music that he brought to us this evening? Well, first of all, I'd like to say that I think that uh, WKCR and you, Phil Schaap, and uh, all the um, support, that you provided for Sun Ra's music is uh, it's very critical and uh, very important 
to the survival of uh, music and probably even more important than music, the survival of humanity itself. Because uh, as long as I've known Sun Ra, the things that he talks about uh, are the things that, that he is. Uh, we often joke around and Sun Ra has a little expression, you know, he says, I talk that talk and uh, walk that walk. And he certainly has been walking that walk. And I think that uh, he's done, um, and you, both have done a very uh, comprehensive job in terms of uh, exposing not only his music, but the uh, deep philosophical and spiritual foundation from which it springs. And uh, it, it just shows uh, the not uh, the total dimension of Sun Ra, because I don't think any of us is capable of doing that. And as I've known him for a few years, and I know the small amount that I know about Sun Ra, I'm really thankful to have been in his presence and to learn the few things that uh, I might have picked up. So I'd just like to say uh, thank you to WKCR on behalf of uh, Sun Ra and all those people that uh, he's been associated with and uh, he's been responsible for bringing me into contact with. And uh, perhaps we can hear some music now. Okay, uh, uh, Sun Ra, you brought up... Uh a work of yours, uh, you worked on it today in terms of uh, editing it for this station's presentation of your music. Uh, all I know is that Pat Patrick brought a message from you on Thursday and said that it's special, that it's coming, and that it will be here before the festival is over. I see it over there on the tape machine, but you, you should tell us more well, about, about it. about New York. You know, I got about nine volumes about New York and different places, a village and different scenes in music and sound about the uh, the Washington Bridge, the different things about New York. I got another song about New York that has, well, it'd probably be New York's theme song if they heard it. Uh -huh. I never did present it. I never, have, it never been sung in the public. It was a very beautiful song about New York. And this is part of it, this here, which I call Manhattan Undertones, which is a little short excerpt, uh, sort of introduction thing to you might call it a sound opera or music. A music. It's a different sort of thing. It's like a sound opera. <clears throat> yeah, that's the, I would say that's what it is. It's Manhattan sort of Undertones. Right. Uh, part of the message from Pat Patrick is there are nine volumes or nine? There are nine volumes. Nine volumes. And this is a segment from just one volume. Yeah. So it's less than one-ninth. Oh, yeah. It, it's probably about five minutes. It's sort of like the introduction of an opera, you know, like that. It's sort of like that to paint it's the a little bit, scene. Is this a little bit of the overture, you mean? Yeah, sort of. Mm -hmm. Okay. This, given, uh, given the main themes all in uh, the be that part, that's what the overture uses. It, it might give you a little excerpt for the end of the opera. What this, this is like that. Well, I, I, a little I, melodic things from the whole thing. I hope that uh, our presenting here of Manhattan Undertones is and and our whole 116 hours of Sun Ra, 116 hours serves only as an overture to more listening, more presentations, and more communication from the creator, so we can hear even more. But I got another piece on that. It's from a movie. <laughs> well, we're going to hear it. It, it, it. It's it's from the movie Space to Place, an excerpt they took out in Hollywood. I'm put it back in there where it belongs because it's a message to this planet. It's essential that they hear it, you know. Okay, we're going to hear now the edited tape from Sun Ra, delivered by Sun Ra today, featuring, among other things, elements that might be considered an overture from his nine-volume Manhattan Undertones. I'm Phil Schaap. I'd like to thank everybody involved. There have been over, I'd say, 25 people who've managed not to make too much noise in this room. And uh, they're all people who have, heard some portion of the message that we can learn from this man, Sun Ra, and this music, this person. I, I, I'm not really... I know, I know. You know, I saved that for last because in this room, 10 years ago, Taylor Storrs opened the mic and said, what would you like to say, Sun Ra? And you said, I am not a man. That's right. Because you know what the Bible says about a man? It said, man is filthy and abominable. Man is appointed to die. It, it, it sounds all kind of bad things about the thing called man. So I can be nothing like that. I'm not filthy and abominable, and I don't want no appointment with death. Uh, man is like the beast that perishes. Why should I be something like that? I think they should get out of that name man and call themselves something else. 
Uh, he actually called himself a demon or anything but man, because that thing, man, is condemned from the day he's born. So therefore, I'm an angel, you know, I'm an archangel now, and I'm going to keep on advance to everything beyond the the man, which I'm, I'm just, I am don't even want to say it. Because <laughs> it's so bad and so horrible that it, it just makes me shudder to think of him man.